ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another Battle Chat podcast. This is Battle Chat number 18. Can you believe it? Goodness me. Uh, and uh, tonight, I've got someone on the show who's shot to stardom recently. Uh <laughs> He's uh, a, a compare in his own right, a podcaster, a celebrity, uh, a man about town, and a, a sartorial genius, I'm informed as well. Uh, but you can't see him. You just have to take my word for it. He's looking very swanky this evening. Um, and uh, the gentleman who I've invited on the show this evening is none other than Mr. Sydney Roundwood. Hello, Sydney. Hello, Henry. Hello, everyone. I don't know about uh, shot to stardom. After the next hour, people probably think I should just be shot. <laughs> oh, God, I hope you don't see coming on this show as quite such an ordeal. <laughs> yes, I'm not going to ask you. So what is the initial takeoff velocity of the European swallow? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, I, we are the Knights of Ni. Uh, but anyway... Welcome, Sydney, and thank you so much for coming on. And now, there are going to be some people in the audience, of course, who might think, oh, my goodness me, not him again, <laughs> because you just recently were on the Meeples and Miniatures podcast with Neil and Mike, who grilled you for no less than, I think it was about three hours, wasn't it, Sid? I was on there for three hours, yes. So <laughs> people may have had enough of me before we even start, in which case, apologies to everyone. <laughs> Tied to a chair in the corner of the Meeples and Miniatures studio, and they wouldn't let you go until they'd, they'd had their wicked way with you. And that was a brilliant show. I mean, it, gosh, you covered a lot of territory there. And I, so tonight, my, my patrons will be delighted. My patrons, amongst whom I have to count you now yourself, Sydney. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sergeant, Sergeant Roundwood. Fantastic. Uh, it, it's almost like this is a good ploy of mine that I, I, people who I think, oh, well, they should be one of my patrons. And I Im invite them on the show and they realize with embarrassment that they're not a patron <laughs> and sign up just before the show, which is fantastic. I shall have to try this out on more people. You, you'd be a millionaire soon when you've got around the entire war game community. <laughs> you've absolutely interviewed everyone on the battle chat. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we're talking about being a millionaire. This We're recording at an exciting time, actually, because you might have noticed, uh, was it yesterday? I had a sort of bit of a one-man Twitter storm because I discovered <clears throat> one of my pals, Brad Harmer Barnes, who used to write for the magazine for me, uh, sent me a little message on Facebook saying, oh, Henry, I've just noticed your, your Wargaming Compendium. It's on sale on Amazon Kindle store for £1.19. pence." He said, do you know about this? And I said, no, no one's informed me. Pen and Sword certainly haven't informed me. So I went and had a look, and sure enough, it was true. So I thought, well, if ever there's an opportunity to get my book out there to the masses, is, this is it. Well, by the end of last night, my book had shot to number one bestseller position on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.ca, which is Canada, and Amazon.com.au, which is Australia, which is absolutely phenomenal. And listeners will be pleased to know that at that cover price, every book that sold uh, netted me a total of about 12 pence. <laughs> so <laughs> when I next see you, Sid, I'll be able to buy you that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'll get all of my 12 pences back because I bought one. <laughs> uh, it's, <laughs> it's a fantastic book. I mean, it's a wonderful book. It brought back it brought back so many memories of old school wargaming books, if you like, when I bought my copy. Um, but it is actually, as I've uh, tweeted about and mentioned to you before, a great book just as reference. And I think it's always pleasant when you write a book and actually somebody reads it and then somebody even uses it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the section on horses is fantastic. Um, I really have used that so many different times in painting. And there's some great inspiration in there as well. And it's a great book for anyone in the hobby, starting up or old school war gamers or people who just want to just put it on a bookshelf and pick it off whenever you feel like having five minutes with it. It's a great well, book. Bless you. Thank you, Sid. Uh, that's what I hoped it would be, because in, in essence, I just sat down and for four years wrote the book that I wished I'd had when I'd started wargaming. Uh, and I'm just astonished because, because this, this, this shooting to number one on the Kindle's charts, the book was pub first published five and a half years ago. It was, it was summer 2013, which is just astonishing, really. Yeah. And I think Penn and Sword themselves can't quite believe it. Uh, but there you are. Uh, I've shown them up because, of course, it should, been their, should have been their marketing people who'd been shouting about my book and getting it to number one, not me. But there we are. <laughs> this is the joys of being traditional published as opposed to self-published a subject for another podcast but anyway um 
Let's crack on, Sid, uh, because uh, you, you, as I said, you covered a lot of ground when you were talking with uh, Neil and Mike. And I don't want to kind of go over too much of the same ground, but for those patrons who uh, don't listen foolishly to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast yet, could you just give a brief uh, kind of introduction about yourself and how, you, you know, your journey into the wargaming hobby? Just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess that as somebody who's now uh, in their 50s, I'm 51, my background is very similar to a lot of other people of around about a similar age in their 40s and 50s. Mm. And it started with airfix figures um, and a background really in the 1970s of growing up with family members who'd been in the forces in the Second World War. Mm. And I, grew, I moved on from airfix figures to metal figures when I uh, came to the school war games club. Mm. Um, and it's really one of those progressions that I remember being at primary school, which in the UK is a school until you're 11. And we didn't have a World Games Club there. And I was already interested in doing something with all these Airfix model kits mm. that I'd put together with polystyrene cement and all wanted to do something with all these um, yellow figures from the Waterloo <laughs> assault set or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. And, they, and the, and the, uh, the comprehensive school I went to, the senior school in the UK, had a World Games Club. And my sister, who's three years old, had told me this. So I was really, really excited at the age of 11 to go to you know, the big school and go to the school war games club. And I can remember to the day, you know, it was only the, like the first week of the first year of senior school. And I trooped into room J7. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, still remember it. And that was where the school war games club met. And, you know, that was quite a moment because then I finally arrived. And, of course, they then said, who the hell are you? Yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing here the normal uh, friendly war games greeting <laughs> exactly fitted <laughs> with so many clubs up and down the line <laughs> um and that was that was really it and for a lot of people um who were blessed with having a school war games club it was just an amazing time a lot of the friends i met there still friends with we had a wonderful teacher called mr farrah uh, lost touch with him years and years ago it's a great shame but he was the guy who ran it with a guy called mr brotherton and uh, the first game he ever played was with lambing medieval figures oh, wow. with the lambing medieval rules and it was uh yeah, the, the, it was quite an experience, really, <laughs> because you're going from plastic figures to metal figures, and, and that's a real rite of passage. But I also joined a local war games club in town, and I was an avid reader, as I mentioned to you when I saw you and other mm. people. I think war gamers are all great readers, and I used to sort of cycle down to the school library, uh, sort of not the school library, the public library, like once a week, get out all the mm. history books get out all the wargaming books again, yeah. look to see if there was any new war games books. Yeah. And that was really my sort of education outside school really it was learning about military history warfare yeah. and uh, playing war games and from there I moved on to university uh, and joined the club in Leeds which was where I went to uni and I moved down to London in 2000 and fell upon the St Albans War Games Club oh, with yeah. uh, Mr Richard Clark and Mr Nick Skinner who are and, they? I've uh, never heard of them who are they I've <laughs> heard of those two guys <laughs> I never really looked back I suppose but it's been a it's been a huge part of my uh, life for as long as i can remember really yeah uh, a couple of points in there i mean for the the memories of the of yes the yellow plastic airfix airfix and then later of course eshi and matchbox all those kind of hoo slash 172 slash 176 scale figures and uh, i was g g flicking back through some stuff uh, the other day i've got a little book about airfix figures here and um yes the influence that they had i mean i'm i'm still kind of astonished really at how much they dominated our entry in uh, our entry path into wargaming for our kind of generation because i'm you know i'm, I'm mid 50 so we're not that much far apart and uh that the trip to the local toy shop to pick up the latest box of you know airfix napoleonic in british infantry or whatever it happened to be and and as you you know mentioned the the waterloo assault set the who the um la Haye saint farmhouse and all that kind of stuff and the influence that that company had on this hobby for such a long time really stretching from the well it would have been the what the late 1950s through to probably the late 1970s actually yeah it's a remarkable track record that's so that's a lovely thing the other thing i wanted to ask you is what did you actually study at university at Leeds? Uh, I, I did history oh I you did, did right so what kind of history did you focus on uh i did a mix, really. It was 17th century and early medieval. Uh -huh. uh, so I did a lot of uh, early medieval history, which was sort of late Roman Empire, uh, 
mm-hmm. um, the, the so-called Dark Ages, but the fifth, mm-hmm. sixth, seventh century, so Anglo-Saxon England, uh, oh, Celtic wow. Ireland, wow. and uh, and I did I did the general courses as well. But it was the early medieval period which really interested me, which came in useful for when uh, Rich said to me, "This Dark Ages thing, do you think we can make a game out of it, which is as good <laughs> as Saga?" I said, I said, "Well, Saga's a <laughs> Saga's a pretty excellent game, Rich. Uh, we are playing Saga quietly at the moment." And he said, "No, go on, Sydney, go on, Sydney. You know a little bit about this." So I dug out all my old sort of textbooks from school and tried yeah. to remember, uh, sort of not from university, and tried to remember yeah. the good bits because when you do Dark Ages history, everyone just is obsessed with getting you to to learn and memorize everything which the venerable Bede wrote. Yeah, yeah. Um, and really, even you know, you just really want to be dealing with. Uh, Things like blood eagles and Viking raiding parties, oh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, picks and things like that. But uh, so I dug out the books which were not really about ecclesiastical history and the military ones, and a lot of that was tra- trailblazed by Guy Halsall, who's uh, right, who's obviously course, an extremely yeah. erudite professor of medieval history, yeah, not a yeah. blood, not a bluffer like me. Um, and you know, that was that some of those ideas which had right back in the. In the 80s was some of the things that I talked to Rich about when he was writing Dux Britanniarum. I'm glad to say he ignored me completely and came up with a really good set of rules. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> which, is, uh, which is why he keeps me around. Just anything Sid says, just ignore it. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> now, I mean, it's really interesting, actually, you, you mentioning that you did some, some medieval stuff. Because uh, when I first got to Sussex University, um, one of the courses I did focused um, uh, in the first year I was doing history at Sussex focused on feudalism feudal society uh and I'm trying to remember the author's name a chap called Mark Block or something was it who wrote yeah, about yeah, feudalism yeah. there we go uh so that was actually a, a really interesting thing and it wasn't up until that point that I'd really thought very hard about what feudalism meant uh and, and that kind of thing so, and it's lived with me to this day interesting but also of course you just mentioned in amongst that 17th century history which we're going to be talking about a bit later um, we are. and so that was that the, the first time you kind of encountered that as a, as a period or was it something you'd known about before you went to university and you deliberately chose that course because of that interest a uh, bit of both, really. I mean, I found at university it was a lot easier to choose your teachers than choose the courses. Uh, so I chose the teachers I got on with and who I thought were great teachers as well as being good historians. Right. Uh, and I was very lucky that the 17th century courses were taught by people I actually liked oh. as opposed to just people you'd kind of tolerate. Um, but I had, I had been interested in the 17th century, yeah, kind of about 17 or 18 years old, really from uh, English literature and sort of Jacobean tragedy and stuff like that, oh, okay. which got me interested in finding out more about the 17th century. Mm. But I really started getting into that what, just as I was leaving university. Um, and at the same time, the range from Dixon's came out, Dixon Miniatures came out for the Grand Alliance, oh, which really was, yeah. I mean, I just think he's just an amazing range of figures in 28 millimeter. Mm. And that got me interested in the period. And the more I found out about the period, the more I wanted to war game the period. And that became a, a big focus, which we'll no doubt get on to a bit later. That's really interesting. I mean, you, again, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of things that I, I, I sort of, I, I, there's something about you, Sid, that makes me think of you reading the metaphysical poets. <laughs> John Donne and all that kind of stuff from oh, you'd be psychic Henry from that kind <laughs> of big fan. <laughs> Uh, uh, I can't remember that was that famous book to my something lady I can't remember uh, but anyway there we go and also um, the, that range of dicks and miniatures and which you describe as 28 millimeter I'd still think of them as sort of 25s more than 28s yeah. because of scale creep in recent years they're uh, kind of 25 but they were probably. they were one of the first sort of chunky ranges of figures weren't they the yeah. dicks and miniatures and uh, I remember that advertising in the early kind of miniature war games when Duncan McFarlane was the editor uh, and then obviously war games illustrated and that kind of stuff great stuff thank you for uh, giving us that little introduction there so that's brilliant um now um you've kind of mentioned already there two of the eras that have kind of interested you historically and in terms of war gaming uh medieval and 17th century and i uh overheard on the meeples and miniatures podcast that you were saying that also uh, napoleonics have figured in your interest and world war one now i remember your world war one stuff because you've got a marvellous blog. I mean, we, we should point out to people that if they haven't been and looked at your blog at, is it Roundwood's World? 
uh, uh, .blogspot.com or something, isn't it? Uh, that's the one. I have to remind myself of what it is, actually. <laughs> I um, it I... is Sydney, uh, all one word, sydneyroundwood.blogspot.com. That's it. Uh, I think if you just put Sydney Roundwood um, into your Google search engine or other search engine, it should come up with me and uh, or just various sort of permutations of Sydney and Roundwood. Absolutely. Uh, so that will get there. Uh, people need to go and look at that blog. First of all, because it's a, it's a frankly, it's a bloody marvellous blog blog Sid and it's been running for a long time I mean I was kind of checked back over you know thought, oh, I'll just gonna have a quick look just to remind myself of a few things and I found myself heading way back to like 2013 2012 it's been yeah. around a long time and and the the wonderful thing about that it's kind of a digital parallel to another thing we're going to be talking about later which is uh, journals war gamers keeping journals and notebooks and that kind of stuff and of course a blog is a great digital notebook and you go you know you can go back for years and unearth stuff and and on there of course it reveals that for quite a long time you've had a big interest in world war one which i'm interested in so talk, tell us about that what, what kind of drew you to world war one as a because i think most people uh world war one's kind of a difficult period isn't it i mean certainly from my point of view i know that because i studied uh, well my my one of my grandfathers was actually wounded at loose in world war one uh and so i heard his horrific war stories um and that's kind of stayed in the family and um in terms of gaming world war one it's really only been in fairly recent years that that it's become more accessible to war gamers in terms of approaching the land warfare of warfare of world war one i think a lot of people like me have always been attracted to you know the red baron and the you know dog fights over the trenches mm -hmm. in the air of world war one that kind of the blue max kind of thing you know but um recreating land warfare in world war one I, I think a lot of us have felt like well it's just a load of bloody trenches isn't it and barbed wire and and murderous bombardments where's the fun in that <laughs> so i'm always interested to meet people who go oh well actually there is this to be derived from world war one gaming that is actually fascinating entertaining or what T so tell us about that interest sid yeah so there's a number of things which are sort of coming together when you talk about World War One and the Great War and Great World War Gaming in particular. Yeah. And that's when the blog started. So just to take one step back, I mean, the blog started in 2010, really because of one of the aspects of what I was doing on World War One uh, gaming, yeah. which was modeling trench terrain. Yeah. Uh, so the idea of the blog was really to try and give back to the hobby and the community. Uh, and I'd seen a lot of blogs which had been around about that time, sort of 2008, nine, with great blogs starting up. And I wanted to start up the blog really to tell people at how I'd got on making some trench terrain, which we used at the Salute Show in, I think, 2009. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't really a blog which was dealing with how you actually create terrain for trench warfare, which was based on modular boards. Mm. So that was really the genesis behind doing the blog. And it sort of went on from there. But so I moved on from terrain to figures to vehicles. Um, and then when I moved on for the first reward, I sort of kept the blog going. Mm. So the idea behind the blog was really quite limited to start with, and like everything, it sort of grew. And I started putting on articles on the blog and scenarios and game ideas and uh, campaigns and all sorts of research on there. So all of that stuff's still up there. Mm. I mean, as regards the First World War, I think what you said about the image of the war as being traumatic, personal and brutal, Mm. that's very much the idea that we get in the UK. And a lot of people like you um, have family who've been traumatised and family members have been <clears> killed <throat> through either all wars, but in the First World War in particular. And there's a real resonance with the centenary, with the suffering and the misery of being created by the war and how much of a trauma it was for in particular sort of communities which sent PALS battalions, yeah, which are yeah. groups of you know, regiments which were formed together with people in very, very close proximity, so mm. friends or PALS. Mm. At the same time, you sort of think, well, how do I make a war game? I have such a, such a miserable sort of experience, such a miserable human experience. Mm. And one of the things I was really interested in was actually keeping that um, aspect of personal relationships within the war gaming and personalizing the war gaming that we did. Mm. So rather than saying, well, I want to step away from that and just have a fun experience, mm. I wanted to make the games very much about big men or actually just men. 
yeah. um, and choosing the leaders that we had at different levels and personalizing their experience through the game. Mm. So some of the games we had were involving um, people who've been wounded who have to be recovered from the trenches. Mm. We had a game involving a chaplain. We had a game involving uh, people who've been gassed. Um, so we tried, I tried in creating the scenarios to keep hold of that personal experience of the war. Mm. At the same time, there's also something which is quite remarkable, which is happening in the time scale of the First World War, which is another military revolution. Mm. You know, the, the weapons in which uh, both uh, sides of the war were armed at the start of the conflict are in some ways very different from the weapons at the end. Yeah. Um, there becomes a much greater emphasis on sort of closer support weapons and mortars and machine guns. And, and that's evident from reading any book about the war mm. and obviously tanks and aircraft. And the, the development was exponential during the course of the conflict. Mm. So it makes the war at a tactical level very interesting. And there are some sharp differences between the way that the British, the French and the Germans, the main protagonists on the Western Front, which is, which is what I war gained, mm. some real differences between those protagonists, which you can put clearly into the tabletop at a fairly macro scale of game, which was what we were trying to do in the 28 mil gaming that we were carrying on. Mm. And at the same time, I've always felt that war gaming is a lot of the fun in war gaming is about scenarios. And actually at the first world war level at the very, the level of platoon or smaller than platoon, you can create lots of really interesting scenarios, which either are reflected from the unit diaries, which created or you take them from one of the secondary sources, of which there are huge amounts, yeah. which have been produced, which look at things like trench raiding. For <coughs> yeah. And you can have some great games um, with that material. Universally, one of the things I enjoyed most in putting on the games at shows, um, taking the game around to friends' houses and running it at the club, was the fact that in all of those games, there was a, there was a human element which we tried to create on the tabletop between the soldiers who were fighting and their relationships within the different units mm. and the gamers who were playing. And that was always really rewarding. Everyone had a good time. Mm. And I was always struck by the thought that actually the people who, if we were ever in the awful situation of being in the First World War, the people who we would be fighting with would very much be just like the people we were sitting around the table with. Yeah. And I always liked that sort of dynamic that we weren't really that far away from the people who were fighting the battle in the first place yeah that's fascinating uh, and because i remember I've, I've talked to rich before and he wrote an article from a magazine ooh, a few years ago uh, obviously when uh it must have been when the through the mud and the blood came out um uh, about the the development in small unit tactics that went on. I think that people get swept away. It's the lions lead uh, lions led by donkeys thing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. This notion that people have of the first world war where there's, there was a whole load of historiography from a particular period where all they wrote about was the misery of the first world war, how dreadful it was. Oh my God, how many millions of casualties there were, uh, how desolate no man's land was, uh, uh, you know, and, and, painted this picture of the first world war as just as a as a meat grinder as a mincing machine of humanity and uh i mean to a certain extent as an overview I, you know i can understand why that happened but also it then misses the detail it misses actually that people were conscious of this impasse that was that had happened and were trying to come up with uh, methods to overcome it and some of those methods were on the kind of macro level where what we need here is a super weapon, weapon and therefore the development of the tank and that kind of thing right and you know uh, creeping barrage bombardments and so on but also at this at this uh, m micro level where you've got these little trench raids of you know g g guys being trained as stormtroopers effectively mm. and the inter one of the other interesting things that occurs to me as I'm saying this you're interested in medieval history History. Of course, often they were going over the top on these little raids dressed in quite medieval fashion with spiked clubs and <laughs> breastplates yeah. and all sorts, right? I mean, I think that's one of the most shocking things when you see some of the... the the kind of the, the the remnants of the first world war and we always we all have it's imagined all these guys just dressed in khaki and there's these guys with these masks and clubs and you know it's it's brutal stuff hand-to-hand -hand stuff but also that 
again is in danger of masking the more sophisticated tactics that were going on you know the the giving covering fire and small rushes forward and so on and so forth uh, tactics that actually you would you would recognize as in afghanistan today as much as you would in in the trenches in the first world war i think that's right and i think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of writing, especially on the American side, about how the First World War tactics are the genesis of modern infantry tactics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, possibly the First World War, slightly back to the, the Boer War. I mean, just to go back to, you know, the brutality aspect. I mean, the, when I also did quite a lot of war gaming with the French force in the First World War because mm. nobody's really doing much with, with France, and in particular with Verdun. Mm. I got really interested in a book by, by um, a French author called Henry Barbousse called Under Fire. And he, right, yeah. the, the book's really broken into two halves. The first half isn't really that interesting. It's all about the unit being formed. Mm. But the second half is really electrifying. It's terrifying as well. There's some horrific descriptions of uh, battle in that book. Yeah. And one of the things I tried to do was to set up rules for the game, which is really based on battlefield stress mm. um, and the collapse of um, individual ability to fight which mm. the French call le cafard, which was the cockroach, mm. which the Barbus talked about as being a crisis of black melancholy, mm. which just attrited and deprived people from being able to make command decisions. Yeah, and yeah. I think that although one's dealing with a fairly you know, miserable sort of in, in, uh, environment, you can have some really interesting games around that, mm. which look at the, the um, destruction of command and control at an individual level. Mm. You know, to what extent does one of the commanders break? Because normally you say, oh, it's just out of command control, it's just happened. But, you know, we took that idea down to some fairly granular levels of trying to think about how different individual commanders would react on the battlefield. So, yeah. as you say, Henry, as, as all, you know, it's medieval as regards some of the weapons being used, but it's also fairly brutal and feral as regards some of the consequences. But, mm. you know, that doesn't mean to say you can't have a really interesting valuable war coming experience out of it. Mm. it there's, there's no trumpets or drums, as they would say, no yeah, flags. Yeah, yeah. Which is different to the period I'm doing now, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's still a really interesting wargaming experience. Yeah. And and actually, one of the things I came to realise uh, as I got older, because my my own interest in siege warfare developed a lot. Crikey, there are so many parallels between you know trench warfare in World War One yeah. and uh, siege trench warfare in any period, really. You know, particularly when I look at my favourite era, kind of the the 18th century, 18th to 19th centuries. Man, there's so many. Par pardon the pun there's so many parallels <laughs> right in 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 those things between the first world war and, and siege warfare god that that was a really good pun i must make a note of that one <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good one i'm just waiting for you to get countervallation in there <laughs> Count contra and circumvallation. There we are. I've been circumvallated, but I'm not going to talk about that. Now, uh, that's fantastic. That's really interesting about your interest in World War One. Something else I heard mentioned on Meeples and Miniatures is you've also got an interest in Napoleonics, and, or you have had from time to time. True. I have. I've, yeah, it is true. I've got a, had an interest in so many periods, unfortunately, like all war gamers, I guess, uh, but definitely in the peninsula, um, which right. is a great which is period. Which as well, the peninsula. Yeah, war, yeah. Yeah. And also the uh, American Civil War as well, and uh, various sort of medieval periods. I'm constantly searching for, you know, what would be the, the best campaign. So you always mm. look at classics like the Peninsula or, mm. you know, Stonewall Jackson's Shenandoah campaign. or yeah, yeah, The yeah. Bannockburn campaign, I think, just makes an amazing campaign. Yeah, yeah. So all of these periods have sort of dabbled in at some point or another. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a, I had a year just doing samurai. Uh, in oh, 2007, really? yeah, I know. Uh, I, I really got really interested in samurai stuff, and uh, there's a collection there, a small small army there, oh, wow. which I've got at home. But you, you, like everyone, you sort of pick these things up, and some you, some you run for a year with, and some you sort of run, run for a lot longer with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, you know Peninsula War, Shenandoah campaign. I could be sitting here talking to Don Featherstone, couldn't he? Because uh, look, at, here's my <laughs> a old little school. younger. <laughs> a little younger, but here's my old school bookshelves right next to me here, yeah. and he's. He, you look at the Don Featherstone books, the Shenandoah Valley campaign, one of his absolute favourites because he was he was mad about that. The Peninsula War, he loved the Peninsula War. You know his skirmish war games book, which is still a classic, yeah. is yeah. is based in the Peninsula War, and 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 you know it's it's also one of the things I like about uh, kind of both 
those campaigns, and I can see why they they're good choices for war gamers. Is they're relatively limited. I think yeah, you know. Definitely. Whilst I love the kind of the vast panoply of the Central European campaigns and Napoleonic Wars, and you know we all love a good you know Leipzig or whatever, right? <clears throat> There's something about the Peninsular War for for the purposes of war games that's just so, it's that much more manageable the forces are more finite you know the the area is more defined uh, the battles are of that kind of typical war games level mm. that you can put on you know with your mates or at a show or at home in a fairly manageable kind of way of course i'm the nutter my favorite salamanca which is the biggest of them in the peninsula uh, but you know um it, it's it's just really interesting you mentioning that but we mentioned those periods kind of en passant because I'm actually going to kind of slightly reverse the order that we talk about some things today. And I'm just going to say, right, we're talking about your favourite period, Sid. Let's go straight to, you know, what your certainly has been your first love for a while in more than one scale, which is the 17th century. And right. So what is it? You explain to me. You, you mentioned uh, briefly uh, on the Meeple's Dimension Show, you know, oh, yes, I like the 17th century. Tell us, what is your real love for that period? What is it about the 17th century that excites you so much? Well, that's a question, isn't it? So most people are going to say, well, that's, that's because they wear stupid coloured clothes and ex, extravagant dress, which is partly about it, I suppose. Um, I think there's a, there's a military revolution which is going on within the 17th century. That's the sensible answer. It's nothing to do with wigs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the real answer is that it's a, it's a period of incredible military change. Mm. So you start where you start out as regards warfare at the start of the century is completely different to where you end up at the end of the century. So you start out really with almost like a private mercenary-based um, army yeah. in most of the states. You know, they're raised by local notables, if you like, mm. or they're raised by gentlemen and noblemen of power, mm. or they're recruited by mercenary formations. Yeah. And you end up with states fighting wars. Yeah. And you have a similar transition in the way in which gunpowder changes the battlefield mm. from small formations of shot to really mass formations mm. of shot. And the whole of army tactics being mm. revolving around those lines of battle, which are so familiar for the 17th century. Mm. And you've got those changes which are revolutionary in the way that armies are mm. raised, armies are clothed and equipped and fed. You've also got a revolution really in how armies are led as well. Mm. So it's no longer just a general sort of rocking up on the battlefield. It's now a profession of arms taken to a real extreme. Mm. And the military entrepreneurs and the military enterprises at the start of the century are really nowhere um, in the late part of the century, it's states who are hiring out their troops, not individuals. Mm. So I think that makes for a great starting point, a great mm. starting point. And then I think you, you're picking a period where, for me, I want to have field battles. Mm. Well, I always think with the, with the later 17th century and certainly the 18th century, the science of fortification becomes such that field battles are less, certainly in areas like the Low Country, uh, Central Germany, Northern Italy. And it's only really you get significant movements in Eastern Europe or Spain and real campaigns of movement. I mean, by the 18th century, it's quite difficult to have lots of field battles because people just retire to their fortifications. Mm. So the real interest, I think, in the early and mid part of the century, up to be about 1670, is that you have a lot of battles which are fluid. You do have fortified centres, but the capturing of those forts isn't nearly as difficult as it is after Vauban had redesigned fortress warfare with, De with um, Cohorn as well on mm. the Dutch side. Mm. And that's why there's a real attraction for me anyway in wars like uh, the Thirty Years' War, to some extent the English Civil War, uh, the Fronde, where you do have these walls of movement mm. um, which are taking place and a, and a larger uh, number of battles being fought in open warfare that you get proportionately, I think, in the 18th century. Mm. So those things coming together make it, for me, a really interesting period. And then the reason I chose the 17th century a long time ago rather than the 18th century is because you've got a lot of variety on the tabletop mm. as regards the different units. So obviously you get pike and shot, you get sort of cuirassiers, and you get writers, or the sort of mm. the routine cavalry. But you do, in the early part of the century, also get more exotic things like you get lancers, you get Croatian cavalry all over mm. the place, uh, you get differences between 
the formations as well. It's not just uh, lines of infantry or even line and column. You get different battalions trained in different styles. You get tercios, you get sort of the very small Dutch formations. So on the war games table, you've got a real variety of tactics. You've got a variety of formations. You've got different weapons being used. Mm. You've got an interface of Eastern warfare and Western warfare. Mm. If you pick your battles within Germany or Hungary, and you've got an awful lot of wars taking place at the same time in what yeah, yeah. You know, historians call the general crisis of the 17th century. It was almost perpetual war mm. um, in the Scanian Wars, the Thirty Years' War, the Dutch Wars. I mean, everyone is literally fighting at one point, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that makes it, you know, terrible time to be alive, but probably a great <laughs> time to be a war gamer. Um, and that, that was one of the things which I've always liked about the period. And I confess i do like the uniforms and i love the flags um and some of the characters of that period i think are on a par with the great captains of history elsewhere and it's always nice to have you know historic and captains that you're trying to recreate their exploits on the tabletop mm. so that is kind of my attempt to answer that question <laughs> now i mean I, I it's it's interesting to me because um having the opportunity to talk to you as um highlighted for me that the 17th century has been probably the biggest gap in my wargaming life uh that i've i've done stuff pre 17th century i've done stuff a lot of stuff a lot of stuff post 17th century and this but the 17th century itself whether that be the 30 years war the english civil war the league of augsburg wars let alone you know the nine the dutch wars of independence blah 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 uh this is something that's only occurred to me recently that yeah do you know what i've got quite a pile of books here <laughs> but i'm not sure i mean the, i've played a couple of english civil war games but a long time ago i think i must have been a school that's how long ago it was. And in a sense, I feel, God, that's scandalous. You know, Henry, mm. Henry Hyde, you know, you're supposed to be one of the glitterati of wargaming. Look at the gap in your armory there. Oh, my God, I'm embarrassed. Well, I'm not really that embarrassed because obviously I've done lot, an awful lot of other stuff. But it is um, really fascinating to me. And one of the reasons it uh, became fascinating, actually, um, well, there's two things. First of all, when I was writing the Wargaming Compendium, this is a story I've told before, there, I was writing, I, I thought I'd better have a, ba a chapter that's kind of a bit of background history about the, the history of warfare in the Western world, you know. <laughs> and that single chapter ended up being nearly two, 200 pages long before I had a word with my editor and he said, now nah, cut that, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, but in the process of writing that, which is still hiding on my hard drive somewhere, I discovered a lot about the 17th century and the and you know the 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 art of generalship and the 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 evolution. In fact, to a certain extent, the revolution in the weaponry. I mean, at the beginning of the century, you've got. Uh, early arquebus match locky type muskets and at the end of it you've got yeah. the flintlock you've yeah. got uh, at the start of it huge mass pike formations and you've still got landsknechts wandering around somewhere mm -hmm. and at the end of it you've got the beginning of the plug-in and then the socket bayonet which transforms the way that infantry and cavalry interact you have this absolute change in the way that cavalry behave from these all dominating kind of knights lumbering across the battlefield smashing people in to then this strange thing where they discover the pistol and they sort of gallop up to within fairly close range of the infantry and loose off a few pistols and then trot to the rear and reload reload whilst mounted you know that's that's going to be a job isn't it think about that folks that's <laughs> one of the interesting things about this period and yet uh, to a certain extent the infantry just stand Stand there and let them do it because they're worried about other things that are going on as well. You have, as you described, Sid, this transformation from these massive Spanish tercios of, you know, three, four, five thousand men in one lump kind of lumbering across the battlefield to at the end of the period, of course, you got what we would probably think of as nippy little battalions of a few hundred men and individual squadrons of cavalry. And, of course, in the middle of it all, you've got Gustavus Adolphus 
you know, uh, uh, and his Swedish cavalry kind of almost rediscovering the, the charge à l'outrance, you know, draw your steel, boys, and, and have at it. Uh, and then in the midst of all this, you've got the English Civil War, which is this quirky little thing, really, sort of a bit of a sideshow. But you've got a number of the officers who served in the English Civil War who learnt their trade in other armies during the Thirty Years' War. And then you've got the emergence of Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, the Roi de Soleil, and this vast, lavish expense on his army and all these incredible uniforms and fluff and feathers everywhere. And then you know towards the right at the end of the century there's the duke of marlborough and a name that we can all recognize and the beginning of a different kind of warfare again with volley firing rather than just firing by ranks and so on so i mean you can tell i'm quite i'm as excited about it as you are i think sid because it is it's just when you actually start reading into the period it's like oh my god you've you, as a complete potpourri of anything you could possibly want as a war gamer it's there plus of course my first love sieges yeah and definitely of Vol- <laughs> you cohorn and volban you know there's two names you just mentioned absolute transformation literally a physical transformation of the landscape by these people and I think one of the, that is beautifully put, and I'd agree with all of that. I think the difficulties in the period are not because it's a fantastic period, which is colourful and engaging and interesting and varied. Some of the difficulties, possibly because Britain and the British armies are not really, apart from the English Civil War, not really at the centre of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, for the English Civil War, we have amazing scholarship on that. We have fantastic mm. books right back to you know, Clarendon and... More recently, Brigadier Young and uh, C.H. Firth on Cromwell's army. And got lots of modern historical scholarship Mm. on how armies were raised, how they fought and the battles which they engaged. Mm. And they are small and manageable battles and they all play really well. But they are all quite similar because the forces are kind of homogenous. You know, the Scots are slightly different. And then there's a dispute about whether Montrose is really leading a radically different army or whether it's just been over overstated how different the Irish were in the army. Mm. But you do generally in the the first and the second and the third English civil wars in England, mm. the armies are pretty homogenous. <clears throat> and I think that for war gamers, once you've played one, two or three games like that, you know, a number of people say, well, it's all pretty similar. Yeah. It starts to be much, much more different when you're looking at the Thirty Years' War in looking at the Polish Wars, the Scarnic yeah. Wars, or the Wars with the Turks. Yeah. The difficulty is that the information relating to those conflicts is nowhere near as accessible. Yeah. And when you start looking at things like the Front, you know, the French Civil War just after the English Civil War, or the Dutch Wars, or some of the wars which the, the, the Imperial forces uh, were fighting against the Turks, the information becomes really hard to find, and then you've got to translate it. Mm. So looking at an army like the Army of the Spanish Netherlands, the Mm. Flemish army, which is a really important component Mm. of the coalition against Louis XIV in the Dutch Wars, and then in the Nine Years' War, the information is really hard to get. You can get some information about the uniforms and the flags, actually getting service information about the size of the battalions, who the commanders were, how they fought, really difficult. So you're looking at foreign language skills, you're looking at ordering things, you know, in obscure bookshops in France and Brussels, and you're looking at trying to visit public libraries, libraries, which are really the repositories of authentic prime source documentation. So it's really difficult. I think that's really hampered the 17th century. It hasn't really had lots of accessible English language information. I mean, even the two probably leading books on the battles of the Thirty Years' War are much disputed by war gamers and scholars, not just on TNP, but also academics as well, as to whether they're accurate. So it is quite a labour of love, but repays all of that labour tenfold over when you really get the focus of the period. Yeah. Uh, As you're talking, I was just thinking, you know, scratching my head about you know source material what is there and i I was just reminded that uh, in terms of british publishers who are trying to make a difference here helion and co 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's wawawahelion.co.uk for people who want to go find it. They've, um, in the last year or two, just come out with a number of titles, haven't they, that are kind of uh, bang on the money for the Absolutely. sort of stuff we're talking about. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I've just found a couple of Armies and Enemies of Louis Fourteenth and War and Soldiers in the Early Reign of Louis XIV. Uh, those are a couple of titles that people might want to go and and, uh, and look up. There's also been, um, uh, yeah, Helian features. What's this? Soldiers of the 17th century. Here we go. So the century of the soldiers, 1618 to 1721. Uh, they've got a number of really quite interesting books going on there. I mean, yes, English Civil War does keep cropping up all the time. Of course it does. Uh, but there are a number of a number of others. I'm saying in the Emperor's service, Wallenstein's army, 1625 to 1834, and so the Scanian War that you mentioned, Charles the Eleventh's War, the Scanian War between sweden and denmark which is rather important in europe and most british people have probably never heard of that war let's be honest um and osprey came out with a couple of books just recently didn't they on the dutch wars uh if I... the dutch wars that's right yeah there's two osprey books on the dutch wars which is uh, from the 16th century to 1648 uh they're both good both worth getting I mean, as you mentioned, the Hillian series, uh, The Century of the Soldier, has been yeah. excellent. So there's a couple of books you've mentioned already, yeah. which are the 14th. The ones in the 30s were really good as well. There's a great book on the Bavarian army. And there's also another really good one about the Battle of White Mountain and the, Bavar and the Bohemian Revolt. Oh, right. And I think that's Lawrence Spring, and both, we're writing both of those, but they're really excellent. I'm going to, uh, you'll see me waving one up oh, on yeah. the camera. Uh, Jeffrey Park of the Thirty Years' War, which is probably the classic in the English language language isn't it on the 30 years war C certainly one of them certainly one of them i mean he that's a really good book and he's visited a lot of the actual battle locations mm. um i mean he's an amazing historian of the 17th century generally yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is, that is a great starting point that yeah. one i mean this another... was first published back in 1984 goodness me uh but but it's interesting the 80s produced quite a number of historians who wrote cracking books um i mean i'm thinking of john keegan face of battle i'm thinking of this i'm thinking of oh, christopher duffy and his various books on siege warfare and so on fire and stone and what have you a lot of them date back you know to that kind of late 70s early 80s period which was a bit of a golden age for, for military history of that kind um and i mean the thing is as well when it comes to the 17th century i mean we've 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 talked uh, in kind of in general terms about a number of the if you like the the, the military technical and tactical developments that took place you know the different uh, i mean i'm thinking of other things like the emergence of the croat uh you mm -hmm. know uh, that then became later on the hussar or the grenz or that we think of in the 18th century of course but the croats were around for quite a long time on the wilder fringes before that uh and and uh, that's quite an interesting thing. I mean, also somewhere in that period, you know, we've got the Polish winged lancers and stuff, for God's sake. I mean, if you want exotic, <laughs> how exotic do you want to go? I mean, you can definitely you can definitely use your Polish winged lancers at various stages of the 17th century and they can fight a wide range of opponents. So, you know, there's Gustavus who's fighting the Poles before he ever turns up um and moves down into germany in 1629 he's fighting the poles in the 1620s and the poles are fighting other imperialists uh various times and the voice fighting the turks obviously as well and you, one of the great things i know you like about wargaming is cavalry and another aspect which attracted me always about the 17th century is the proportion of cavalry to infantry yeah and um, you get some of the battles of the 30s were like Honigfeld, which is predominantly ca cavalry who are fighting. Yeah. About 10,000 cavalrymen of various different types and a huge swirling mass in the middle of the field. Um, you've got significant forces of cavalry in many of the 30 years war battles, even to the point of being almost like half the army. Mm. Um, you've got French armies who using a significant amount of cavalry in the Dutch wars. And you've got the development of the Dragoon. And the Dragoon yeah, is yeah. a as a really so there's a lot of different um battles which i think you can fight which are using cavalry forces uh, scouting reconnaissance or major 
formations. I mean, a lot of the work which has been done on the Croat forces in the 30s as well recently sort of emphasised the fact that they were being used as battlefield cavalry. Mm. There was a significant skirmish the night before Lutzen in which mm. Isolano's Croats um, fight against the Swedish um, yeah, cavalry forces of, uh, I think it's the Finns and also the Skarhanska's Finns and also mm. the Swedes before the battle. And they are fighting in a battlefield formation mm. in addition to being excellent at the petit guerre, the sort of scouting... Yeah, yeah, yeah rapacious sort of work which those sort of forces did in the 30 years war so using those different cavalry forces legitimately on the tabletop is something you can definitely do in the 17th century and no doubt you can probably do it in the 16th century in the 18th century yeah. as well but the 17th century for those who love cavalry and different yeah. formations of cavalry and different usages of cavalry it's a great period um, and you can legitimately almost fill your table with as many writers or Carassials or lancers, as you want, depending on which army and yeah, which yeah. period you choose. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a couple of interesting things amongst that because, yes, you're absolutely right. I think for 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 many people, you know, because I'm writing my series on tactics uh, for War Game Soldiers and Strategy magazine, and uh, it's one of those interesting things that because no, under normal circumstances, you oh yes, light cavalry, uh, they might be on the kind of flanks of the battlefield, but most of the time their job is out, you know, in the petty guerre, as you say, they're doing the, the ambushes, they're doing the raids, they're doing, you know, the protecting the army on the march, all that kind of stuff. But then there are occasions when they prove that they they can fight as battlefield cavalry as well as anyone else. I mean, this happened that other thing that we mentioned earlier, the Peninsular War, where you know French hussars and chasseurs and British light dragoons and hussars, and particularly the KGL King's German Legion hussars were superb battlefield cavalry, and they okay. could take their place in the line as happily as anyone else and perform as well, if not better. So I think that is another a fascinating thing, but also. So uh, the, the cavalry, I mean, is something I do get excited about, and it is wonderful because even the word you use there, you know, in passing, uh, a cuirassier. Of course, if you're a Napoleonic's fan, a cuirassier means one thing, but of course, you and I, when <laughs> we're thinking of the 17th century, you know, cuirassier is something rather different. This is a man who's clad almost head to toe like a medieval knight. You know, certainly in the uh, Hasselrig's lo lobsters in the English Civil War, of course, they wore sort of three quarter length armor, didn't they? So sort of yeah. just below the knee. But these were guys, you know, who were wearing pi at least pistol proof armor. Um, uh, and you would think were almost unstoppable. But then often what they did was this peculiar thing was instead of charging in with a sword or lance, they charged in and did the caracol with their pistols and trotted off again, which, you know, it's, you, you're in the middle of this incredible melting pot. You can see live <laughs> experimentation taking place where you and I might look at them and say, oh, for God's sake, draw your sword. No one's, no one can stop you if you decide to charge in and a few years Years later with less armor of course that's what they were doing but here they are in this mo monstrous amount of armor and they're just trotting up to the enemy to within 10 paces and presenting a pistol bang and back to the rear and reload you it's 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 an extraordinary thing isn't it Sid? it's a really strange thing and i think that a lot of war gamers have really struggled with this in their rules yeah. and actually struggled with it just as a concept you know why would you caracol which is as you say henry that process by which you as a horseman go to the enemy and discharge your pistol and then move your horse to the rear and somebody else takes your place yeah. why would you do that rather than just sort of getting stuck in yeah. and i think that the truth is possibly that in different circumstances those troops might have got stuck in but you know under different commanders yeah. or different battlefield circumstances they decide not to do yeah. i mean the imperial cuirassiers at lutzen were fairly ferocious. I mean, yeah. they were well, they were very well mounted. They were very well disciplined, and they were the forces that really sort of did mm. for Gustavus. Mm. And he was actually killed by a unit of Piccolomini's cuirassiers. And yeah. they would just trot in, discharge their pistols, then use their swords. So yeah. far as we understand it, yeah. but other units would, as you say, just caracol. And the French. Um, that was a popular tactic by the 1690s yeah. for the French, where they were seem to have been happily charging in or at least trotting in in the 1670s. Yeah. So, yeah, different tactics being used in addition to different weapons. Yeah. Uh, because uh, also, I mean, it, w we should be fair to them, I suppose, because we're imagining them trotting up to uh, you know, most people think of infantry as oh they're these guys with muskets and bayonets but of course they're facing huge hedgehogs of pikes a that's lot very of the true. time 
yeah. Uh, yeah. which is a, a completely different story. You know, it's hard you it's hard enough to get a horse past a row of bayonets, let alone a, a row of ten to fourteen foot pikes. Uh, almost which, impossible to penetrate. Almost yeah, so impossible to penetrate. Off, yeah. <clears throat> which is, of course, one of those other interesting things that's happening, kind of, with military theory at the time, isn't there? Where you've got this resurgence since the kind of the late fifteenth century, sixteenth century, of the pike formation, which was last seen in the ranks of Alexander of Macedon and the successors. Yeah. Which is an ex- it's an amazing kind of melting pot of tactical ideas so at the same time as you've got this gradual technological advancement of gunpowder and and the matchlock moving on to the flintlock and so on uh, and wheel locks the expensive wheel locks you know the kind of a, a clockwork mechanism to fire your pistol which is wonderfully kind of expensive and exotic but they did it you know they did it and and at the same time you've got these uh, the, the 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 technological advancement with the firepower being protected by this throwback to ancient times of the of the pike formation yeah so some of the tremendous fun you can have when you really go down the wormhole with uh, the 17th century is that you can realize that that similarity of just seeing a pike formation carries over in the way that contemporaries wrote about it so you come to some it's the great age of the military manual as well so the sort of military writers of the 16th century they're nowhere near as voluminous as they are in the 17th century and some of it in the 17th century is just gloriously crackpot (laughs) and so you've got stuff like Pallas Armata which is entitled Military Essays on the Ancient and Grecian Art of War now half six books at least they were when uh, they were published by the Pike and Shot Society and out of all those six books about two of them really relate to 17th century warfare but about the rest of the work really relates to the views which were taken on military yeah in the marshalling of grecian infantry or the macedonian phalanx and yeah, what yeah. the romans did with their maniples yeah. and then they try and extrapolate this as william of orange had done in the late 16th century they try and extrapolate this to the battlefield and some of it's just like ludicrous and in all of those books there's only really about three or four pages about the battle. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> you get to this endless stuff about being a wagon master or what you do with camp followers and how yeah. you scout and the best way of preparing your camp, all the things that the ancients would write about. But yeah. when it comes to what you actually do in battle, yeah. there's like about five or six pages about the battle. And then there's a long, long section about what to do if your army is shipwrecked and <laughs> basically destroyed in the yeah. field. But you, this guy's right, who was you know, slightly experienced, but you, this guy's writing all of this stuff really about the ancients and trying to sort of put that as a military maxim for his current time. Yeah. And that's a classic sort of 17th century thing. The people who you really want to writing about battles, like Prince Rupert, are writing really basically not much at all about them. Yeah. And you get these military theorists who are writing a huge amount. And sometimes they cross over. Yeah. Uh, one of the imperialist generals does write about his experiences, which is really interesting. But that all adds a lot of fun to trying to work out a set of rules for a period. And mm. that was something that... You know, you and me have talked about in the context of trying to do battle scale rules or large tactical rules as opposed mm. to just skirmish rules, yeah. where you can really have that interface of military ideas and formations and history, especially in the micro scales, yeah, to yeah. try and reflect those all of those field battles that I mentioned earlier on the tabletop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, And that's, you know, nice segue there, Sid, because uh, this is, I've I've just been swinging around in my chair here and I've got a glance to my side. And of course, yet the the efforts to write rules for the 17th century and I've, I've got a pile of stuff here. I mean, we could, uh, you've obviously got your own favourites. I mean, amongst the pile of books that kind of mention the 17th, it does go back. I mean, I've got Don Featherstone, his War Games Through the Ages series here, the volume two, 1420 to 1783, in which he he does, you know, what, what year was this? Goodness me, this would have been 1960 something or 1970 something. What's the date in this? This is 1974. This was published. He does mention the Dutch Wars and the Wars of the Grand Alliance, 1672 to 1679 and 1689 to 1697, for example, and he talks about the tactics and he 
gives uh, kind of um, uh, recommendations about how you should rate the commanders of the different size and t typical battlefield layouts and that kind of stuff. Uh, so people if, people who love collecting the old school books, I would certainly recommend that one um, because that's still you can still find that on eBay fairly regularly. Another one he wrote, Don Featherstone, bless his heart, Wargaming Pike and Shot. Um, yeah, it's goody. Uh, it's a lovely book. It focuses mostly uh, actually on non-English Civil War battles, which is mm. really interesting. There's a lot of a Battle of Arcs and Newport and stuff, and he gives uh, maps of the battlefields and so on. Uh, a, a cracking book. That was um, John Featherstone. When was that published? That was first published. He said flicking in 1977 so there we are late 70s <coughs> another name that you can't ignore when it comes to uh 17th century so george gush of course uh george gush who wrote the famous war games rules for the wrg for 15th to 17th centuries 1420 to 1700 <coughs> which has been uh john curry of the history of wargaming project uh, has kind of republished that in a bigger format together with some uh, slight additions and amendments because that interestingly enough WRG who I was talking to uh, Richard Lockwood with about the other day of course uh, on this show uh, the WRG Ancients Rules famously ran to seven editions and then became uh, became DB whatever you want to be DBX DBM DBMM DBA DBR yeah. blah 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 whereas the the Renaissance Rules by George George Gush only ever had one edition, curiously enough. Uh, first published in 1979, and then nothing else was ever done to them. Maybe they were just completely perfect. Uh, or, <laughs> I was going to say, that's they were how just some so people, perfect. They were so perfect. But then John Curry just, I think it was last year or the year before, uh, obviously had a word with George Gush, and they kind of republished it in this slightly bigger format. And um, George has made a few minor amendments, apparently. I haven't been through it with a tooth comb to find out what they are. But they exist. So the History of Wargaming Project, um, folks who are listening, that's um, w -w -w wargaming.co. That's it. Just just wargaming.co, not .co UK, just .co. Um, and he's been reproducing a lot of the old original things. But but um, there's that set of war games rules because that fell into the mould of what was then the standard WRG war gaming rules, wasn't it? Where you well, had yeah. one figure equals what was it, twenty? Twenty. Men? Twenty in those. So I know there's well, and they were the sort of staple of war gaming for that period. I think in the 1980s and 1990s, and I used to play those at competitions. Good Lord, it was a competition oh, really? game at one Good point. God. Yeah, so they are an amazing set of rules in a lot of ways. And uh, George Gush, Mr. Gush, I feel like calling him Mr. Gush, because yeah. his contribution to the Renaissance hobby was immense, utterly yeah, yeah. immense. I mean, the, the War Gaming Armies book that he held up yeah, for yeah. the time that he wrote that um, is quite astonishing that he collected yeah. all of that information himself no doubt pre-internet, relying on yeah. his interlibrary loan services. 1975 and, it was. Yeah, the generosity of his local librarian. And yeah. I, you know, it's quite an incredible book that one individual did that with the Ian Heath illustrations. And yeah. that was a great, that's a great introduction to yeah. War Game in the Renaissance and a really amazing book. And the rules are quite, are quite fun. Um, but they 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 creak and strain when you ex when you extend them over geographically and time periods mm. for those which they used. So the the army list which accompany the rules cover everything in the world from 1420 to 1700. So you yeah, can yeah. find your samurais against Hundred Years War English. <laughs> against Transylvanians under Bethel and Gabor yeah. and Louis the Fourteenth and. So I used to fight my Louis the Fourteenth French and William Mike British under those rules, and I was always incredibly aggrieved because under those rules they've got salvo fire, but they're absolutely useless. And no surprises that I think Mr. Gush's armies of choice were probably um, something Polish, and yeah, they, the yeah. Poles under those rules were simply devastating. Oh, so 
many, many memories of getting my troops hacked to death by winged hussars. And I always used to think it's quite amazing. You'd have thought that if those armies of Louis XIV were so useless, how did he come to con- <laughs> conquer almost <laughs> Europe? And that's probably because, like the Turks, he turned up with 200,000 men and the Poles yeah, were yeah. hard-pressed to collect 3,000 or 4,000 winged hussars. I'm just looking at the beautiful illus- in his bitterness. illustrations of <laughs> winged hussars. Yeah, yeah, a bit of bitterness there. <laughs> They're is- amazing rules and that, that, that they are really a lot of and that book is just bloody marvellous. It was £4.25 back in the day. Uh, and then, of course, you know, t- sticking with WRG so just for a minute, of course, they that transmogrified into DBR, De Bellis Renationis, which is kind of the Renaissance yeah. version of DBA. Have you ever which goes the this? other way, and then you get the turbocharged later 17th century armies in those rules, like the Williamite one and the, and the Louis XIV, which are, which are murderously good. Oh, so right. you don't really want to fight those out of period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that, there we go. That was uh, Phil Barker and Richard Bodley Scott, of course. Other thing, now, here's, I don't know if you'd have seen this one or remember it. Uh, I, I remember back at school playing quite a few Napoleonic games f- with the Newbury rules. And here's the Newbury Renaissance yeah. set, uh, <laughs> which was written by Trevor Holsall and R.G. Boss. I don't know who R.G. Boss was, but Co- Constantinople. <laughs> to Vienna for the period 1450 to 1700 uh, and again this is in that mold where one figure equals 20 men and a move equals a minute and all that kind of stuff there's quite a lot of tables of factors and stuff you know sure there are <laughs> it's, uh, it, and you know very specific frontages for all your different types of foot in whatever order they're in and 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 the rules are written very much well yes here we go so we've got orders and so rule 11 is orders 11.1 game orders 11.1a 11.1b 11.1c and so on it's very much kind of a tournament structured rule set um yeah. and slightly terrifying for the uninitiated um, you say it's part of the journey to where we are now absolutely. isn't it absolutely whether, you, whether you'd go back and start over again from that point that Absolutely. set of rules in your hand, the new brief fast play rules. I know, it's like the old <laughs> Irish saying, if I, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. But anyway, there's. then we get on to, you know, coming on later, it's more modern. Of course, then there was the Field of Glory uh, came out um, yeah. with its Wars of Religion, Western Europe uh, thing. And there's probably another one as well. The, there's, I think there's also a Lace Wars kind of thing. Now, Field of Glory is one of those rule sets that lots of people swear by. Apparently, they're used a lot in tournaments, I'm told. Old, but I've never actually played them. But the books are really pretty. You know, if you want insp- visual inspiration, there's lots of kind of Osprey illustrations in them. You know, so if you want to set rules with some Osprey illustrations, it, 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 they're really lovely books and they do cover, you know, the 30 Years War, pretty pictures of some miniatures and that kind of stuff. The rules themselves are, are very dense. There's lots of tables in here. And I think, again, <laughs> For for someone who's un- not initiated in them by someone else, I think it's quite a big thing to kind of bite off and chew on. But it does look interesting. There's lots of information. Have you ever played um, Field of Glory? I have a set of the rules, but I have to confess, I bought them more because I was a completist than I really wanted to play them. Oh. Because they are they are quite dense, and they're of the stable of the Newbury rules or Tercia rules or WRG rules. They're very different to some of the more thematic rules, um, principles of war or Baroque or Hazaria. Uh, And I I personally think that all of these rules have had a great place and that each one of those sets of rules, and I mentioned a number of others as well, Beneath the Lindy Banners from Barry Hilton as well, uh, various sets from the the Pike and Shot Society, each one of those rules was definitely well-intentioned, well-researched and moved things on Mm. and were great for at least a few games mm. whether they collectively or you know have got to the place that the renaissance period wants to get to the jury's out really because yeah, yeah. the period is because it's a complex period with yeah. lots of different troop types who can inhibit yeah. the same um, inhabit the same battlefield yeah. i think that makes it difficult to write rules and also the whole thought behind pike and shot not a combined pike and shot in a you know, musket and a bayonet, yeah. but the pike and shot, the use of subunits, the tactical use historically on the battlefield of different units of pike and shot, that's yeah. always been a problem for 17th century war gamers. Yeah, yeah. Partly because nobody really quite understands 
what happened in a push of pike. Yes. I mean, yeah. some of the some of the Stuart Reed books for partisan press back in the eighties, Gunpowder Triumphant, did a great job of bringing together all the English language sources relating to what was a push of pike. Mm. And it still isn't clear exactly what was really <clears throat> happening. Mm. And I think that that's really made it difficult for rule writers to be able to create consistently accurate easy to play rules in that period yeah, yeah. and all of those rules all of those rules all of which were well-meaning rules which give you know a variation of good games to great games mm. or, and, and all with great friends I and mean, we've got to say that even if the rules aren't great the friends make the wargaming yeah, yeah. all of those rules have taken things further forward but they mm. haven't necessarily always got to a point that you can actually say well, actually, that's a really good representation of the period, and that yeah, is yeah. test against using it with all different formations. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of those, a lot of those rules had the difficulty is they felt that they had to be comprehensive. I needed to be one needed to be able to fight all the wars of the 17th, 16th yeah. century. So you're going right from the Italian wars right up to Louis the 14th or Charles yeah. the 12th, and that's that's just impossible. Mm. Uh, I personally think that's impossible, mm. apart from in a really sort of generalist sense. And some of the best rules for the period, I think, really narrow it down to specific mm. wars or even specific periods within wars. Mm. And if we'd have known all that in the 1980s, we might have ended up with well, yeah. a slightly better set of rules. But it's all the journey, isn't it? It's yeah. all the part of the journey. Because you're talking about kind of generics. I mean, I'm, I'm holding up here the, the, the <laughs> pike and shot variation yeah. of, uh, you know, the, the whole black powder series. Pike and shot. And then there are a couple of supplements. Uh, the Devil's Playground, which is kind of 30 years yeah, war. And cool. the last argument of Kings, which is kind of uh, takes us into the uh, late 17th, early 18th century. Now, I, I think for a lot of people... Uh, I mean, a, a lot of people obviously are aware of the black powder. It's become a genre, hasn't it, of its own? Yeah. And yeah. certainly, you know, the books are fabulous. I'm, I'm holding them here. I can hardly, hardly hold them up. They're so heavy, weighty between the three of them. They're, they're beautiful to look at. There's some, you know, fun scenarios and that kind of stuff. And I think for people who just who want the kind of the look of the period without the headaches you know mm. of actually doing the research there's a lot to be said for them and you know they're, they're nicely beautifully produced nicely written books with a lot of there's a lot of background material in there and certainly if you want inspiration looking at beautifully painted model troops uh, and flags and that kind of stuff you can't really go far wrong uh, but obviously when one talks to kind of specialists of the peer of a specific sector of that period they tend to be slightly dismissed because of course you are only getting a somewhat generic feel of the period you're not getting specifics in there that's that's true i mean i i, I like pike and shot rules i think that they uh, they they flow really well uh i like the devil's playground i think that there's things which are wrong potentially wrong with it on the army list but then of course anyone can say that mm. without actually having produced their own i think they're a decent starting point i've got to say and i think you can make those into an absolutely great game by careful scenario design yeah. um there's also a set of rules called baroque by dardy and piombo uh which i think is really good europe at war 1550 oh, to 1700 isn't it yeah yeah that's a really nice set of rules and that is uh really made for the 30 years war and sort of eastern european warfare yeah. uh, that plays really well but i think all of these sets of rules they can all produce good games and you can elevate those mm. to fantastic great games with the right players and a really good scenario mm. and there's lots of interesting asymmetrical or uh time critical um battles within the period involving different troop types or attack defend or encounter yeah, yeah. battles or also fixed fortifications on the battlefield there's lots of different ways you can turn just the basic set of rules as a toolbox into being a really fantastic set of rules. Yeah. And all those rules are kind of flexible enough to be able to embrace scenario-specific rules. Yeah. And I think that's where you're using the rules, not just to sort of line up across the tabletop and play yeah. edge hill all, all the time, yeah. is to use those rules in a really sort of imaginative way. Yeah. And I think all of those rules do embrace that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, have you heard of, well, some people would call them GAPA. GAPA, it's actually yeah. Air, Air yeah. I'm told by Pierre Broden. <laughs> it, the, the G is silent, it's Air Something of that nature. Uh, 
actually quite fascinating, quite different sort of mechanisms of play and that sort of thing that my chum guy and I are sort of exploring for the Malberian Wars that we're just getting into. Um, that's something I think would was certainly because they were originally written specifically for the Great Northern War, that's uh, right. and then they've been developed for the Malberian Wars. Maybe, maybe that's a set that can be brought backwards into the 17th century. It certainly seems to cover most of the you know options that would be available. But anyway, I think we've kind of um, uh, talk quite a lot about rule sets there which i do find fascinating because it's again for me going and looking at my shelves and discovering oh actually i've got quite a lot of rule sets that <laughs> i could use you know yeah. i i am a collector of rule sets as well as a collector of you know other things uh and i know you're you know you you, you said that you're not much of a collector of miniatures you say your your actual collections are quite modest but you you collect knowledge uh, along the way. <laughs> collect rubbish, and some of it is useful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I've never been. Um, I, I tried to, when I've tried to do periods. I've tried to do them for a period of time, which allows me to sort of have different games and different scenarios in that period. Mm. And I think I probably mentioned before somewhere that uh, on Neil and um, uh, Neil and Mike's show is that I think if you pick your period right you're just going to love your period. And then yeah, you can yeah. create scenarios out of that period. Yeah. The challenge is to find great scenarios. And that's all about reading history. Yeah. And that's also about using you know, two or three of the books, which are really my war games favorite. And that's going back to um, sort of scenarios for war game by Charles, Charles S. Grant, yeah, yeah, program yeah. war game scenarios, yeah. by Charles S. Grant yeah, and yeah. others like that. But those two books have given me such inspiration and yeah. they are just wonderful. They're starting points again, yeah. but that just shows how many different scenarios you can create, um, which are generic. Now, each one of those scenarios in almost all of those, forget about helicopter assault, for instance, but yeah. almost all of those scenarios you can yeah. adapt to the 17th century. Yeah, yeah. And it, for me, war game is really about finding a period you really enjoy and creating scenarios within that period. Yeah. Um, and that, for me, has been the thing to collect, is to collect raw gaming experiences and games with friends, mm. as opposed to necessarily having to have multiple different periods. I mean, that being said, you know, there's always another army that one's planning or another regiment and stuff like that, <laughs> because that's just who we are. Yeah, yeah. But um, I've always thought that there's enough material out there in the 17th century to, to keep anyone busy for you yeah. know, a, a very long period of time interesting again mentioning those two books because i think the 1981 was the first one about 1983 the second one of yeah, those that was yeah. a golden period for that kind of writing uh, now obviously uh, i mean you know that's great kind of uh, look at what's available for 18th century gamers there and of course there's a lot more figure ranges available as well for people in any scale pretty much now there's a f oh god a pendraken nearly stole my wallet with their league of augsburg range i've yeah, they are resisted lovely. resisted yeah. so yeah. far yeah. 10 Indeed. mil as a because and this you know already mentioning their 10 mil rather than i mean there's always been God, minifigs back in the day uh, with their 17th century ranges, English Civil War, and they already had 30 years war stuff way back then, didn't they? Uh, Hinchliffe had an English Civil War range, never actually went overtly 30 years war, but they've been there. And a number of other manufacturers um, over the years. But what's become, you know, uh, obvious in more recent times, in the last decade or so, is that th th this era has become available to people who are heading into micro scale gaming of one kind or another. And micro scale, we probably say sub 15 millimeters, so 12 mil, 10 mil, 6 mil. And of course, the, where we're going to end up here is you've gone to the almost the nth degree <laughs> at two mil. Now, I obviously a couple of weeks ago had a fascinating conversation with Mark Backhouse about this. Mark, with whom you collaborated at the, Mark is the man on that period. The, yeah. uh, the man on that period and that sc scale, scale. Uh, and that wonderful game you put on uh, with him at the other partisan last year uh, of the siege of Portsmouth, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, the effect that that had on me looking at that, and I could see a lot of other people who were just like, oh, blimey. You know, they literally were stopping in their <laughs> tracks, didn't quite know what to say to you guys, but looked on in an astonishment when they realized, yes, this is a very attractive table with these tiny, tiny troops on. And it, it, 
just out of you know the the initial reaction is it makes people think differently about their war games now in to a certain extent you touched on this in the meeples and miniatures show but i kind of want to push this further because it's i'm really interested in this where i mean there's the obvious thing where you can portray at that scale which we probably ought to call nano scale rather than micro scale at that scale you can portray a big swathe of countryside with many 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 tens of thousands of men upon it so uh the, the, one of the first you know the things we're going to talk about here is that there's this interesting crossover where you're talking about a size of game or should we say a scale of game in the true sense which is approaching or matching that of a board game so you've got a miniatures game with enough maneuver room that it will match what most because most board games tend to be pitched not at the micro tactical level unless you're talking about something like you know advanced squad leader or something like that most board games are pitched at that grand tactical slash strategic level and that's one of the things that struck me about the game at the other part Sam, which is like wow there's a lot of maneuver space and i was saying this to to mark wasn't i yeah. but, wow there's there's flanks. There's more than fl there's flanks and rears that are exposed. There's and then that your mind starts like oh god there's lines of supply potentially that are vulnerable. There's there's all manner of things become possible because of the degree of manoeuvre space that there is, and that even with on you know we're so used to setting down a battle you know we've got our six by four or eight by six table or whatever it is and and there's the flanks you know those straight edges of the table there and the troops go from one flank to the other or near enough and the game is very much it takes on this agreed confinement i mean is this one of these interesting concepts in wargaming that we have to agree like two boxers in a boxing ring there's the ropes we're not going to go outside the ropes it's too it, 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 the game becomes something different if we go outside the ropes so we agree to have our fight inside this box whereas in a game of the scale that you had there the potential becomes something other. Now, whether you take it, you take up that potential and develop that is one of the things I want to ask you about, because I do find this you're at that fascinating kind of interface between the tactical and the strategic. So yeah. talk to me about that. <laughs> because I, I find that fascinating, Sydney. That 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 the potential that that has. Well, that's the key. That's the key aspect which you can gain by changing your scale, because you're changing your perception of the game that you're trying to realise on the tabletop. But before we talk about that, one of the things that it might be useful to think about is, is to possibly imagine what a contemporary, and let's just use the 17th century as, as an example, mm. only as an example, but a contemporary would have been thinking about trying to engage the enemy in a particular location and wouldn't necessarily have just been focusing about the actual field of battle itself. What you're really trying to do is, as a commander of a 17th century army, is you're going to be responsible for almost everything mm. from supply to clothing to manoeuvre uh, and to bringing the enemy to battle. Mm. So to achieve that, those are the qualifications of a perfect captain, somebody who really yeah is able to sort of defeat the enemy in the field, but getting the enemy there and being able to find the enemy are key components of the anatomy of victory. Mm. So the elements that you'd be thinking about is, well, how do I bring my um, opponent to the field? How do I get my own forces into the field and deploy them? So going back to what we were talking about before, relating to the military manuals of the day, a huge amount of focus is really given to finding the enemy deploying your own forces, uh, enabling the logistics, because the general is in charge of all of this. He would have had subordinates, but there's really a small cabinet of advisors he's got. It's not like a modern um, core commander would have administrators all around. So you're elevating yourself to the commander's level. And let's sort of go down to the detail of what made some of the armies successful. 
in the field. Well, if you read Mr. Gushy's rules, George Gushy's rules, mm. you'd find that the Poles won all their battles because they carried a lance, an axe and two pistols. Because you know, you could you could <laughs> have plus three with your lance, and then you could uh, you could have one for extra pistol, and I think the axe gave you a bonus as well. <laughs> so you were going to hit in two rounds and always break your opponents. Well, it didn't really work like that. The poles were ferocious in close combat, especially the cavalry. But the difficulties that the poles had was that they could never get enough cavalry, apart from in you know notable deployments, and obviously mm-hmm. the siege of Vienna was one deployment. They could never really get enough of those noble cavalry together and they had tremendous interfactional rivalry between the polish nobility mm. so deploying significant forces was difficult mm. let's contrast that with the turks what do you think of think about 17th century turkish army you think of hordes of akinji you think of flanks one of the most terrifying things with the two mil army is if you deploy it correctly in the correct numbers you've got terribly exposed flanks and that was a big problem for the swedes when they were fighting uh, against the poles and also other opponents they just didn't have enough troops to cover the flanks and that forces the commander then to think about field fortifications that forces the commander to be able to move from one town to another mm. you can't spend a lot of town uh, time in an in an open environment you've got to move quickly mm. so two mil as a scale or six mil as a scale allows you to open up the flanks so cavalry forces mm. start to be really effective Mm. Imperials with their Croats, their abundant forces of Croatian cavalry, they're able to be extremely effective against other forces which don't have that amount of light cavalry. By the 16th century, uh, by the 1670s rather, the French are using dragoons not really as we would think of them as a sort of naff kind of battlefield cavalry a road mm. on a, to dismount. The French, in, the, the, one of the key elements of French success in the Dutch wars is that they start using their very significant amount of dragoon forces to raise contributions. Mm. So the the word dragoon in English comes from dragon arts, which is these forces, um, these these campaigns which Louis XIV raised, um, started against internal opposition. Um, Dragoon forces went down to the Mm. south of France and basically uh, pillaged local Huguenot um, and... um, recusant and also um, internal opposition towns Um, and they would just steal the money they'd burn the houses they'd kill people and that's the sort of tactics that louis starts employing in the low countries Mm. so dragoons are going out very significantly in front of the french field forces by 20 30 40 miles there's one account of the french dragoon forces where the french are on the border the French dragoons are trying to raise contributions and check um, internal passport and trade tariffs around Antwerp. So 60 miles ahead, they're just operating, you know, almost like a panzer division would operate yeah, before yeah, yeah. The, the, the mechanized infantry. Yeah. So having forces on the tabletop which can take advantage of space, which can move quickly, so Turks, Imperial Croats, French cavalry to some extent, that is an environment which means that you really start to be worried if you've got an infantry-based army about where you're deployed on the field. Mm. So you can take some of those historical elements from the period and start to pick together your identification of what engagements you're trying to fight. So you're moving away from that classic sort of 17th century battle, which must be the same in every other period, Mm. of two forces locked in a a table six by four. Mm. You've now, on a six by four table, you're in developing a whole grand tactical picture so you've got flanks you've got supplies you can deploy baggage in the appropriate um ground scale your artillery can be accompanied by a train and gosh that's going to take up a huge amount of room and only be available to move slowly on roads and not really move in the battle at all Mm. you've got a whole different sort of environment which you're trying to plan for and one of the things we found in the two mil portsmouth game is that we really quite enjoyed trying to create a campaign on a table. Mm. You could have multiple engagements within the same afternoon in yeah. Newark at Partizan. Yeah. But what you were really wargaming is the campaign. And you can do that realistically in two wheel because the figures are small, they're portable, they're easy to move on and off the table, and you can credibly have different locations, especially mm. if you slightly shrink the um, or have a slightly different ground scale for the figures than you do in respect to the actual location. Mm. You can you can shrink an action for a whole campaign onto a mm. tabletop. And that is similar to a board game in some respects, but unlike a board game, mm. 
you're not inhibited by only to move, able to move between different provinces which are identified on the board or see yeah, different yeah. hexes or different squares. You've got a fully fluid map-based terrain set of tiles or just uh, on a tabletop. Mm. So you can treat it as a war game mm. with the same parameters that you sometimes have with the board game. Mm. And I think that's really attractive as an alternative. Um, it's not necessarily a better game, but it certainly is a different game. And what appealed to me was that you could then read the military manuals at the time with more sense. It no longer then became, oh, I'm waiting for these seven or eight pages about battle, and that's a bit rubbish because he doesn't really tell us what he should be doing, yeah. which he, Sir James Turner, who wrote Parsimonte, doesn't tell you how to win. Mm. He tells you the kind of things which happen, but it's not an A to Z of how to win. But mm. taken together, the broad expanse of that book and all of the different elements, like, as I mentioned before, the wagon masters, the supply chain, how to deal with the artillery, your golden bridge from the battle, once your forces are potentially defeated, when to leave the field, how to deploy your reserve, all of those grand theoretical military points that those writers are trying to communicate, those points become realizable mm. on a micro scale game mm. because you have the space to be able to physically model that and you have a space on the tabletop to represent that mm -hmm. in a way that you can't really do in 28 mil. You can, of course, rep reflect in 28 mil an attack on the baggage trade. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult to reflect that as a component of the battle in a credible ground scale. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking you're, you're describing this for uh, 17th century games. And of course, I'm immediately you know thinking my first love the 18th century one of the things that's really difficult in most war games is when you have say prussian and austrian forces it's almost a foregone conclusion a lot of the time that the prussians are going to win a set down battle because their their infantry is unstoppable and you know the cavalry under seglitz is unstoppable and it makes people think well, why on earth would i want to be austrians but the fact is the austrians managed to carry on the war against prussia well for seven years hence the seven years war <laughs> how did they manage that it's because on campaign precisely as you describe they had all the croats they had all these people who were fantastic at the petit guerre they were great at sending off raids to you know and they had frederick had this desperate job countering the forces of maria Theresa in a campaign context so this is where uh, looking at a micro scale representation of a seven years war awards the austrian succession kind of sin, uh, situation is hugely appealing because at long last you can show well actually the austrians were really bloody good at this bit yeah. you know when it yeah. when they got toe to toe with the prussians and the prussians had their their steel ramrods and a lot of the austrians still had wooden ones that broke off in the blooming muzzles poor sods you know uh, but you know it became more difficult but the austrians were brave and capable and on in in the mm. campaign context they were often brilliant and oh, really difficult really difficult to fight against a force with that much experience of, of frontier warfare i mean that's Absolutely. the real asset of the croats and you know being able to form in battlefield formation Absolutely. as an extra but really they excel in that pretty good because they're so used to it and the plains of hungary are fairly expansive exactly. and they're used to fighting against comparable forces with the turks yeah. this is where the hussars came from you know yeah. it, it, there's there's so there's relevance there but i'm also thinking for example of the american war of independence where yeah. you know in a set down fight yeah, the Redcoats are going to blast them to kingdom come. But you think you think of a number of American uh, War of Independence scenarios where actually you get this almost tumbling battle where the the the, the, the damn rebels won't sit still. You know, so we we fight, we beat them out of one position. Oh, and they sit up again over there. What's going on? The American Civil mm. War. God, you know, you describing, you know, the dragoons going ahead and causing mayhem or Jeb Stewart, for God's sake, this is what the Confederate cavalry was so good at for a lot of time. And then the, the, the Union cavalry learned from them, didn't they? Mm. You know, and their cavalry became brilliant as mounted infantry, effectively as dragoons going off and, you know, causing mayhem. And so this is where, you know, I think this is a kind of a significant thing that's kind of happening here. It ought to be a significant thing where you and Mark are presenting this uh, 
notion of a war game that is kind of breaking the confines of what for decades we've been thinking of as a typical war game which is your 28 mil which is still lovely of course as a thing to do your 28 mil pretty painted troops set down on a six by four or an eight by six and have at it and oh it's just a thing in itself and of course you're you're talking to a man who's nearly finished please god writing a book about wargaming campaigns so to, this to me is a potentially really exciting development i mean for me personally quite apart from any, whether anyone else tries it you can bet sometime in the not too distant future you're going to see me trying out some of this stuff be great. Be, because there's also this fluid i'm thinking of other situations in, in the 18th century where you've got a siege and the whole thing of uh you've got uh, uh the the place being besieged you've got the lines of contravallation and circumvallation oh and there's a relief force turns up to tr attempt to break the siege and the army has to kind of oh christ we're now you know facing two ways how are we going to deal with this now in a in a in a nanoscale game where you've got the space to do that and then work out what the consequences of that are you know that's that's marvelous there's other things you can do at a nanoscale that would be much more difficult at, at a bigger scale which is and i think bless his heart this is charles grant or charles s grant who described this uh, a few years ago the notion of a rolling terrain so mm. what you do is you have your terrain boards and you might have you know your initial setup might be eight feet by six feet but the 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 campaign part kind of moves on and so you add some tiles at one end and take them away at the other so the terrain can actually roll and change and now Whereas at 28 mil, that would be a bit of a nightmare, actually. You think about it, unless you've yeah. got really basic terrain. You've got any kind of sculpted terrain, that's a nightmare. But of course, in a nanoscale, where even a major hill may only be a few inches tall, suddenly this becomes you know, a possibility. So I think there's, there's an awful lot in what you and Mark have been doing with the nanoscale stuff that is... Uh, I'm really optimistic about and is really remarkable. I mean, not least the way that you and he sculpt blooming two millimeter stuff onto bits of, <laughs> onto bits of board. It's not that difficult. Um, it's not that difficult. Well, I saw you making your, was it disordered markers or shattered yeah. or something like that, yeah. you know, on your blog, people go and have a look at the blog. There's a lot of stuff on there. That's just so inspiring. And then, uh, as you were saying on the Meeples and Minchin show, you need to develop a different eye when it comes to painting the stuff. You can't paint two mil like you'd paint even 10 mil or 15 mil. That's right, because you're just you're trying to reflect just a group of troops. You're no longer trying to reflect yeah. just a troop or a figure. And I think that that's where, as I mentioned on the other podcast, you know, the depictions of what contemporaries were trying to uh, do when they were painting battles becomes really important yeah, yeah. and I think there's a there's a wonderful sort of interrelationship between us as war gamers looking at a table and a contemporary looking at a painting mm. and you would expect that the com contemporary who commissioned the painting would want the painting to look something which was recognizable to what they were doing it's a bit like if you're a painting done of your house you want to make yeah, it look yeah. like the house that you're going to fit the painting in maybe you tart it up a little bit and you don't show the sort of everything <laughs> which is a problem and i think that that's certainly true there's there's not many dead bodies in 17th century paintings true. in the battlescaping it tends to be there's a representation in the foreground that was the convention yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you certainly want something which is recognizable and some of the work which has been done on Peter Snayers and Sebastian Branks has emphasized that their work, certainly the work which was commissioned by acting uh, commanders, was pretty realistic and mm. pretty accurate by comparison to some of the prints which are then done of the battlefield. Mm. Mm. So we probably get to the point that saying, well, some of those battlefield paintings are a good representation of what it might have looked like. Mm. And it just so happens that that fits quite well, that model of having figure blocks, because that's how they were painting them. They were yeah. they were impressionistic. And that's yeah. what we tried to do relating to the two mil yeah. actions. So uh, one of the things that, sorry, one of the things that we were talking about doing mm. uh, next year, I'm sure Mark mentioned it, I think he did mention it on the battle chat before, is Constantinople in 1453. Yeah, yeah. But another project would be to try and think about finding 
a good representative siege of a star fortification or town with Vobanic fortifications or or early sort of trace Italian fortifications mm. and reflecting that in two mil. Mm. And you would then have the ability to be able to sculpt all the sort of siege works. But rather than it taking being a project which would take years and years and years to try and reflect that, because it's two mil, you can probably do that in a weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, God, I mean, that I was excited about Constantinople. And yeah, my mind's racing so much here, Sid, about, oh, my God, there's so many things that become possible <laughs> when you approach it from, you know, the, uh, the nano scale, you know, the, the Vauban fortresses and so on and so forth. Because, you know, I I am dying to get some some proper siege war games under my belt because I love the subject matter. Uh, and of course, suddenly at this scale, it becomes so doable so doable you know we, we've mentioned that the, let's talk about the paintings a bit because one of the other things that's so kind of lovely about uh micro scale and nano scale stuff is that uh, it it starts to really look like those paintings that any of us who are interested in military history have seen you know either at galleries or in books uh, and the 17th century uh, is particularly rich in some wonderful particularly kind of dutch and what people who would now think of as kind of belgian painters uh, uh because then it would they would have been from the what the spanish netherlands i suppose that's right that that's era, right uh, yeah. so we're talking i mean i will put these names and links to the google images searches that i've done up on you know in the in the post show notes for people to look at but painters like uh, peter merliner uh, sebastian franks david teniers and uh, who's this other uh, peter snayers uh, P- that's peter snayers um you know and i've got four pages of large scale uh, google image searches up here and they're just glorious i mean they're all painted in that kind of wonderful dutch the style would be known as chiaroscuro you know light and dark uh but just with vast numbers of people in them, most of them, you know, you've got the, the usually a general on a prancing horse in the foreground uh, with vast numbers of people in a battle in the background. Some of them are just incredible. Um, and are the closest, of course, that they had at the time to real battlefield photography. And that's right. You, say, you know, right. we, we have to kind of trust that these artists, were, I mean, they were commissioned by kings and generals, you know, so uh, they were expected to produce a realistic scene. Uh, so we can, we can pretty much say that as, as near as they were able, these are in inverted commas, realistic battle scenes, aren't they? Well, that's right. I mean, Snayers, Snayers is patron, is, is a patron patronage by. So one of Snayers' patrons was the Imperial General Ottavio Piccolomini, who was one of the key commanders at Lutzen. He was an Imperial, um, he was an Imperial commander, mainly of a cavalry commander. He had, he, he had, and um, his palace in Italy, um, which is in Tuscany, I've been, and it's um, open to the public. And it's an amazing place just on the edge of the Tuscan Hills. I mean, the guy was seriously, you know, by, after the Thirty Years' War, he was seriously in the Premiership League for Imperial Commanders, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, and his um, patronage allowed Snayers to recreate Piccolomini's actions in the Thirty Years' War and also sort of fighting the French. And th- those images... I think people, when they've written about Snayer, said, well, he's writing under the direction of Piccolomini. So Piccolomini wants to memorialise his victories or his engagements, mm. and he makes sure that Snayers gets the details correct. Mm. Um, and that is one of the ways in which you can have some sort of confidence that the images which have been depicted, in particular by Snayers, are not just genre paintings Mm. one of the difficulties i think with some of the prints from that period is that you do drift away from accurate representation to genre pictures Mm. as genre prints the same sort of problem exists for the english civil war you've got some very accurate prints like the famous one of naseby Mm. uh, and then you've got a lot of prints which aren't as accurate as as some of the battles Mm. so selecting um, the accuracy from the inaccuracy is really interesting. And actually, on Twitter today, there's a there's a uh, I think it's the guy, the gentleman side of Swedish or Finnish. I think he's Sw- uh, Swedish. He posted a great um, page from a book from the Thirty Years' War of um, supposedly Irish and Scottish mercenaries. Oh. And 
the the printer had obviously commissioned the artist knowing nothing about what an Irish or Scottish mercenary looked like in the 1630s. And you've got two images of Turkish janissaries, or one looks like a Dennis, and the other one looks like a janissary, because they were suitably foreign and nobody would know the difference. So you do have to be really careful in the 17th century, because oh. battle painting becomes a real industry. Yeah, and certainly yeah. by the 1660s and 1670s, it was the vogue to really have in your Vorhuis or whatever your establishment would be in the Netherlands or yeah. the Spanish Netherlands or, or the United Provinces, you'd have a battle painting, yeah. rather or not you'd actually fought yourself. It would just yeah. be the sort of thing that you would have, a little bit like a posh car on the on the on the forecourt. Yeah. And there's a huge industry in producing pictures of people fighting. And by the late yeah. 17th century, the images by people like Wuvermans and to some extent like Molyneux as well, they just are generic pictures of troops fighting in a close formation and you're close to the action mm. and i'm really interested one of the things i'm interested in i don't know the answer to what extent does that bear any resemblance at all to how troops were clothed and troops were fought i imagine mm. not a great deal and there's not much written on it but i think certainly in the early part of the century when the, these grand battle paintings are being produced by Branks and snares mm. they do seem to be you know, reasonably accurate. And I think that for war gamers, there's a huge amount of inspiration there, not least because it's a depiction of a battlefield and units and formations on a battlefield. Yeah. So it's not necessarily as good as a photograph would be, but it, I think what's really interesting is how the contemporaries wanted to memorialise that. Yeah, yeah. Fair. And I think that, as much as anything else, is what's really interesting and important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at some of the paintings by Snayers here. I, one one of the things that's, of course, is curious about the period, it's uh, it's in that era before they actually understood how a horse actually galloped. So there's <laughs> a lot of horses in the sort of prancing position. It was only actually much later, wasn't it, with the uh, in the early days of, of cinema and photography that they used the, was it the Daguerre type or whatever, where they were actually able to film a horse galloping and discovered, oh, yes, there's that particular sort of cadence that it has. So you get a lot of these horses in, the, in the, that sort of curious prancing position. But the, the, as a record of the kind of the the geography if nothing else of mm. the battlefields and stuff you you got to assume that you know that must be pretty accurate or people would be turning up saying well that doesn't look like where i live in the same way as you know there's another uh painting here he did where there's a you know a, a typical vauban trace fortress um yeah. uh, which is of course some of these things can be verified because as i wrote about in my siege um uh, siege warfare series in my magazine a few years ago now uh, there there are these wonderful wonderful uh, models that were commissioned by louis and other kings of europe uh, commissioned from the engineers and architects yeah. literally miniature renditions at kind of two mil scale pretty much of the actual city and the 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 trace of the fortifications and the bastions and ravelins and all the rest of it absolutely fantastic so you know we can cross reference these paintings against things like that but it's also in terms of an aesthetic uh sid i mean it's one of the things that i uh, you know i've always found fascinating because one way or another, you know, all war games are based on aesthetic choices. They're, you know, mm -hmm. the, the choice of miniatures we buy, how we paint them, the kind of scenery and terrain that we build for the to play our games on. And I think um, <clears throat> there's an, I, I heard, uh, is it Neil on Meeples and Miniatures said, you know, there's an awful lot of games where you see 12 men and a flag, you know. Uh, whereas, so what you're actually doing, your war games that look like reenactments reenactments right you know a, yeah. lot, a lot of us have been to those waterloo reenactments where there's a couple of units of 12 blokes and the flag <laughs> you know and a couple of drummers and a bugler uh, and there's an awful lot of war games that look like that so one of the wonderful things about doing the nanoscale gaming is that you can actually you know almost completely approach 
the the aesthetic of a painting you know that it is a tableau a tableau vivant almost you know a tableau that's kind of moving and you're interacting with which is a rather wonderful thing and as i say it's, it kind of introduces a different dimension to your wargaming now i know yes there are people out there who say oh yeah but i like my 28 mils i like to be able to see the eyelashes on them well okay that's fine that's that's a perfectly acceptable choice and that is one aesthetic but this is also another perfectly valid aesthetic where you're 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 representing a battlefield painting not you know thousands of individuals that have yeah. all got eyelashes right I, th I think that's right and neither way is better than the other both are different ways mm. i think we've spent a lot of time as a as a hobby as a community quite rightly developing our rules and developing um the things that we think are really important to the hobby obviously i've the figure manufacturers have got better, paints have got better, the rules have got better. Mm. And one of the things which I'm quite interested in doing is you know, developing that two mil scale as a scale in itself and trying to do some interesting games in that scale. Because I think for a long time, everyone's had a load of two mil figures around because they bought them from Irregular at some point. They thought it'd be a great <laughs> idea. And people may have painted them up or they may have just let them sit in the bottom of a bag which they arrived in from E&K. Yeah. Um, and if that's if that's the case, then part of the journey with Tumor is to try and sort of encourage people to give that a go. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think yeah. then for me, um, I think then for me, one of the other aspects that I want to try and think about is how you actually then marry up the two mil or the micro scale gaming or anything beneath 15 mil yeah. and the 28 mil gaming. And to what extent can they then be part of the same viable campaign that you're then engaging at one level in with the 28 mil or 15 mil mm. at a closer scale using those figures at the best uh, in, in their best environment, let's say, yeah, yeah, but you've yeah. also got a campaign style game or grand tactical game, which you're gaming out with two mil. Mm. And I think if you marry those together in a set of rules or a set of campaign mm. environment uh, scenarios, you're really getting the best out of both scales yeah, uh, yeah, because yeah. both have a part. Yeah. Uh, and that's absolutely right. I mean, again, particularly in a campaign context where, uh, or, or, you know, uh, even if it's a series of linked scenarios, I think it's important that you feel you want to play out as many encounters in that context as possible because it's fun apart from anything else and there's going to be certain contacts uh, i've just been writing about this where you've got let's say um you've got say two cavalry patrols that uh, are hunting each other you know you've been declaring your coordinates oh we've got a contact here oh what is it oh yes well mine's a patrol oh mine's a patrol as well now under normal circumstances, oh, what's a what's a cavalry patrol? Okay, let's say let's say it's a squadron of cavalry or a troop of cavalry. What's that in reality? You know, between thirty and a hundred blokes, let's say. Okay, under normal circumstances, how many miniatures would that actually be? Okay, oh, not very many, half a dozen, right? Mm -hmm. Don't really want to set, go to the trouble of setting up a game where you've got half a dozen guys and so have I. So one way of changing that is to say, well, let's effectively change the scale at which we're representing the game. So instead of one figure representing 30 guys, you let's change it. So we've got one figure representing five guys or 10 yeah. guys or, or even just one guy. So actually, let's get all our cavalry toys out and pretend that they're just these two squadrons. and you can either place it using the same rules just adjust some ranges and that kind of stuff or you could choose a different rule set than you'd normally use say like sharp practice or something like that mm -hmm. to play out a game at the appropriate level and in just the same way you can say well okay up to a kind of a brigade engagement or a divisional engagement yeah let's get out mid 30 millimeter spencer smith if we're talking about oh my god the declaration is your whole army's there oh my god my whole army's there geez we're talking about fifty thousand aside <laughs> we need to think differently right unless we bring in a whole load of other blokes who can bring their collections as well and we'll hire a hall and play it out right like like the big things i organized in Aiton. so this is where no we don't have to do that oh look let's get out the two mils or the six yeah. mils or whatever it is and we've got a, a rule set that's appropriate for that scale of game 
Um, I mean, one of the rule sets we didn't mention earlier, which on you know, in passing, I think we probably should have. There's probably a variant, isn't there, of the Polymos rules that Pete Berry does for his Bacchus miniatures. He's got an English Civil War set for certain. He does. He does. Somewhere Absolutely. between the English Civil War set and his Malberian set, I'm sure you could cobble together, a, you know, 17th century kind of set. So this is what I, you know, I'm finding really you know exciting as the potential is this it's just a as you, as you say it's another tool in your toolbox you know that's right I, I don't think of myself even though i've got uh, thousands of spencer smiths over there i don't think of myself as a 30 millimeter war gamer i'm just a war gamer and there are times yes when i love to get the spencer smiths out and play a game of that kind and the certain old school nostalgia but there's other times when i want to play a really big battle so <laughs> you know something like two meals is going to be fantastic and there's going to be other times when i just want to play a little skirmish so i will yes folks i do enjoy painting miniatures and i will get out my few beautifully painted black scorpion pirates or whatever it happens to be because that's the appropriate it's just a small encounter and I enjoy playing that out in that way. So the the whole, you know, we need to look at, you know, these things are a toolbox. And one of the other advantages, as I'm sure you've mentioned and, and Mark's mentioned, is at two mil, it's all so easy to store away. It's not like you're saying, oh, my God, I need to have thousands and thousands of stuff at 28 mil. Oh, my, I've run out of space in my attic, <laughs> right? At two mil, it's a couple of shoe boxes. Yeah, so I've got the Thirty Years' War in three A4, basically shoe boxes. You yeah. know, and there's everything, including the terrain in there, yeah. and that's a huge advantage because that makes it portable. But I think in particular, it makes it easy to bring out and pack away. Mm. Uh, one of the things that I find is difficult about really big twenty-eight mil games is just how long it takes to set out and how long it takes to put away. Um, conversely, you've got in twenty-eight mil, you've got an infinitely flexible. Small, small, uh, larger scale physically mm. to work on things which are also important in whatever mm. period you choose. So, if you want to understand small unit tactics, you're not really going to do it in two mil. You could do it in two mil, but most people wouldn't. You might do mm. it in six or ten mil, but 28 mil is perfect for that. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the nice things about talking about two mil is that people know I'm actually a 28 mil gamer yeah, yeah, who's yeah. gone to the other extent of the scale. Yeah. And I certainly wouldn't use two mil exhaustively but i think for create for getting inside the period which i want to get inside and understanding how that period might have worked because nobody really knows for sure let's be honest mm -hmm. about it it's a useful it's a really useful tool and it has a synchronicity with things like you know designing terrain making maps um thinking about some of the political aspects of warfare mm. yeah and those macro themes i think sit really well with that two mil aspect mm. Mm. so you can try and reflect um allies really well on a mm. tabletop battle with yeah, two yeah, mil yeah. or micro scale gaming you can reflect political diversity in the command really well with micro scale gaming you can of course try and do that in 28 mil but you've probably got less troops on the on the average table mm. so you're trying to reflect a political dynamic between different brigade commanders it's what you really want to try and reflect mm. is a political dynamic between the swedes and the gustavus adolphus and their saxon allies at breitenfeld yeah. or between wallenstein and tilly in the imperial force mm. you want to really have a force which represents those political difficulties of coalition warfare yeah. in the nine years war so you want to have an english command you want to have a dutch command you want to have a german command and you also want to have some subsidiary troops as well mm. and with that you can easily do that in a micro scale in 10 or 6 mil or mm. 2 mil and you can credibly have the forces which were available to those commanders as mm. as the battles get bigger mm. difficult to do that quite as well in 28 mil mm. so again you're opening yourself up by you you've reduced the scale of the figures to figure blocks mm. you've actually elevated your command level and yes. you become concerned with the things which rode the commanders of the day and because not everyone could write and prints and presses were in their infancy. You mm. don't get as many of the personal accounts in the 17th century as you do in the 18th. And of course, the 19th century is the great yeah. age of writing about warfare and the American Civil War. It's the great age of letters and the First World War as well. But you don't get all of those personalized accounts of 
how people were fighting the battle. So you look at something like Sidon and Poise in the, uh, the German wars and then the English Civil War. He does write about his experiences, but he doesn't really write about them in the granularity as somebody would write about you know, their engagements in the First World War. So your levels of interaction with the key, com- key personalities is really at a top command level. Yeah, you understand yeah. what the dynamics politically are there, mm. and that enables you with two mil to get inside that particular track in a war game. Mm. Um, and that's another advantage of the, the micro scales, I think, which suits that period well. Wouldn't necessarily suit the First World mm. War well, when you, you, you can't, even with two mil, really um, credibly model the conflict. You can't mm. model the Western Front credibly in the Kaiserslacht or Verdun or Passchendaele in two mil, mm. because I think that it's such a logistical war that something like a Kriegspiel or a board game is potentially yeah, a better way of doing it. Not the only way, but potentially a better way of doing it. But you can, in the first war, drop to a micro scale of individual platoons or or um, sections of men and have a really credible, accurate game mm. because you have those tools available for personal insight, which goes from personal recollections of people being there, of letters written home, of diaries of officers, of unit histories. You do not have those if you're trying to um, recreate Nordlingen, 1634, mm. or you know, one of the Dutch wars, like uh, battles of the Dutch wars, like Cassel. Mm. You just don't have that historical granularity. Because mm. you don't have the same degrees of literacy, of course, which, you know, in that yeah, period, yeah. you know, and, and this is one of the things that's, that's really interesting what you've been saying there, because it's it immediately bringing to mind, let's go back to the Peninsula War, shall we? Why not? Or, you know, the diaries of the riflemen and the guys in the light infantry regiments that have been handed down to us uh, from that period, because uh, for a number of things, first of all, a gradual increase in literacy mm. and also so, of course, yes, that granularity, because you're talking about a lot of small unit actions uh, mm. uh, that were uh, pinpricks, in a sense, in the overall scheme of things, but also kind of important in the, uh, the, the reportage of those conflicts that has been handed down to us. Whereas, as you say, in the 17th century, the people who are communicating any th- thoughts at all about it are the senior officers they're aristocratic for god's sake you know and and they've got their own political motives for wanting to do so and you know in the same way as they they'll adopt a particular pose in a portrait that they're 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 posing for uh, and have certain things in the background and have their hand on a globe and all these kind of little choices that are so critical you know uh in, in that context it's a form of politics and you get a different kind of politics a, more, a greater democratization of the literature that's handed yeah. down to us at the further you know to the point where nowadays soldiers go into action you know with blooming head cams going straight <laughs> yeah. to youtube which is just extraordinary yeah you do that that democratization of the literature of warfare mm. you really start to feel that in the 19th and 20th century yeah, yeah. so you you do have issues with survival of literature physical survival of letters and diaries yeah. which don't exist but it's rare that you have somebody like celia fines who's writing the english civil war about her husband nathaniel fines mm. it's rare that you find something which is introspective Mm. And even rarer that you find that introspectivity in a historical account by a soldier who's fighting. Um, And that's one of the reasons that you draw, potentially, you draw the camera out and you focus on a larger level. So you can have, again, credibly about um, the French invasion of the Low Countries in 1672, because you know really well Mm. what Louis XIV's decision-making process was and how Mm. split his cabinet was uh, about that decision and how much of a personal influence he had on that Mm. as a genesis of a war, Mm. because that's all recorded in the meetings of the French Council, which he's meeting with his chief advisers. But what you don't have is anything equivalent about how I'm raising my army of Piedmont or Normandy, you know, my difficulties... You know, unless you really go into the weeds and spend a huge amount of time with mm. the actual administrative details. So mm. it's a question with some periods of really trying to sort of find any of the literature and sort of mm. stick your pin in and say, well, I want to go with this because there's just more of it. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that does make it tempting 
to create your own. Yeah, yeah. Nice segue there, <laughs> Mr. Roundwood, brilliantly glancing down at his notes there and noting that actually we've got more to talk about. Um, fortunately, Sid has messaged me to say he's okay to carry on talking because uh, I'm finding this fascinating. I hope you are too, Sid, uh, and enjoying it because uh, this we've gone past a couple of hours, I think, uh, but we'll we keep sorry. going for a little bit more because with certainly a couple of things that uh, we we also wanted to talk about because I think that they're, they're subjects that both you and I uh, share a love for. And uh, the first one is uh, what you call alt-historical war games. Now, and I think it's going to be important to let you describe what you mean by that, because I think a lot of people are familiar because of me, you know, and the, all the stuff I've written, apart from anything else, and I'm not the first one to write about what we now commonly know as imaginations, you know, uh, make up your own countries uh, using the, the the technical term is it's Ruritanian. Um, think of the Prisoner of Zender. That's a, what's known as a Ruritanian novel, and that notion that comes back from you know it's a, a, an honourable tradition from the nineteenth century and. and before of people kind of setting a story in a completely made up country uh, and obviously I've done it with my Prunkland and Fountainland and Charles Grant bless him the senior did it with his uh, Die Vereine der Freie Städte and the Grand Duchy of Lorraine and uh, Tony Bath did it with Hyboria to a certain extent I mean one, one of the interesting things actually about both uh, Grant and Bath was they used real historical armies uh, but just gave them different names uh, and in fact, Tony Bart's Hyboria came out of all the people who were gathering for what were then the National War Games, Ancient War Games Championships, wasn't it? Uh, starting in Southampton, whenever it was, back in the 60s. And they thought, well, let's find something else to do with these ar ancient armies. Oh, yes, why don't we come up with this thing and, you know, base it on the, the Hyborian novels and away they went. So you had Vikings fighting samurai, fighting Persians fighting whatever, but just given their own, you know different names. In the same way, Charles Grant, of course, his uh, Die Vereine der Freie Städte was very obviously Prussia, and the Grand Duchy of Lorraine. Well, depending on what game he was playing, it was either the Austrians or the French. As long as they had white coats, he wasn't too bothered, I think. <laughs> but alt history is uh, something rather different, isn't it? Sid, so over to you to kind of tell people what you mean by alt history. <laughs> yeah, so people probably think I'm just going crackers, which I'm happy to accept. I probably am. <laughs> um, but it's a thing that I don't, well, just for a start, I'm not even sure it's a thing. It's not necessarily anything that's going to be written down, but it's also something I think a lot of war gamers do anyway. But I think it's got some mileage to be stretched a little bit more, which is part of the fun of the hobby. So people should bear in mind what's going to follow is just fun. They're just another way of having fun. Yeah. But we talked a little bit about the problem of accessing foreign literature sources, translation, actually finding sources for some of the obscure things which are going on in the 17th century. Um, and I've also talked about having a focus of a period. So, you know, we all lead busy lives. Some of us are slower painters than others. Yeah. Um, some of us you know, have a desire to do one period in debt. Mm. So some of the thoughts that I was having as I went back to the 17th century after the Great War uh, was to really sort of make the most mileage I could out of what I wanted to do in the 17th century. So I wanted to do something which wasn't British. I wanted to do armies which were not British. They were going to be French and they were going to be imperial. And in particular, they were going to be Flemish. Um, and I knew very little about the Spanish Netherlands, modern day Flanders, uh, modern day Belgium, in fact. Mm. Um, and information was really, when I started, quite difficult to find. So what I thought about doing was to try and get away and liberate myself from having to painstakingly research every detail mm. of armies that I just couldn't find the information for. Mm. I might be able to find some flags. Well, actually, I couldn't find any flags relating to Flemish cavalry of the late 17th century because none survive. You know, you've got bits of fragments, but you don't really have the flags. Mm. Um, I couldn't really find out much about the uniforms. I could find them for the governor general of the Spanish Netherlands, but I couldn't find the militia details which were raised in the towns. So you're in a situation, it's like a dark room, and you know there are things in the room and you get glimpses of them, but there's no light. You can't flip the switch. The fluorescent light's not there. There's no table lamps or anything like that. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you just give up and you say, this is too difficult? 
well, actually, I think the period's really interesting, and I think that location is really interesting. So what you do is you try and extrapolate what you do know into something which is credible, mm. and that's a necessity. So if you like, as my friend Rich Clark would say, you make it up. <laughs> well, you do. You do, Rich. You do make it up. But you make it up with a with a way in which you're trying to stretch what's there already. And yeah. you do it with some figures and you do it with some flags and you may do it with some formations. But why stop there? One might not want to jump into the world of imaginations and Ruritania, yeah. but you might want to do things to enhance your period. So you might then want to think about what was really happening within a particular historical period and to stretch it. So maybe you know, it, there were the possibilities of recruiting units of cavalry, which didn't historically fight in that location, mm. but you really want to build up. Mm. Perhaps you want to develop your own history for what happened. Mm. Perhaps you want to have a point of historical departure in your narrative for your campaign. So, for instance, uh, Louis XIV fell grievously sick in 1660. Mm. What if he died? What if there'd been a second front, the second French Civil War? Yeah. Who would have been the opponents in that situation? What happens if Harold doesn't die in Hastings in 1066? What happens if any one of a number of different historical events didn't happen? Where do you take it? And there's kind of a vogue, I suppose, in that at the moment. If you've watched the Amazon series, The Man in the High Castle, you know, what if yeah. the Nazis won World War II? Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not history, folks. Yes, <laughs> that's something which is made up. That is fictional. Mm. But part of the fun is weaving in that history mm. with the uh, actual imagination that you have. So one of the things that I thought about when I was reading um, about the Spanish army of the 1660s, which is a really obscure sort of title, um, is you know, what if there was a military order which still existed in the same way as the medieval military orders? What would they look like? How would they be armed? How would they fight? Mm. And as I was making that up in my own head, as you like, I did then find out that the order of Calatrava, which is the one I chose, did actually survive until the 18th century. It was just demilitarized in the 1670s, I think it was. Oh, right. But you can create... A historical narrative which is plausible, mm. fictional, but plausible, and that can be fun and that can enhance your game. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what I'm trying to get at with alt history. It's something to liberate a war game from just having to endlessly just create the armies and the formations that they know about. Yeah. And I'm sure that people just do that anyway, mm. you know, either through a chance card or through a scenario detail. But doing it deliberately, I think, can be a lot of fun and how you how much you do or whether you do it a lot or a small amount whether you go all the way to making an imaginations campaign mm. in all but name is really up to is really up to the individual but for a long time I felt that you know, we possibly do that anyway but making yeah. it into something which is fun I think we can do a lot with so the campaign I ran a while back relating to Verdun uh, had all sorts of this bits and pieces thrown in. So we had poison gas being shelled into 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 Paris by the evil Germans uh, in, in, in that particular campaign. We had Verdun falling to the French. We had all sorts of French uh, spies uh, acting on the German side and vice versa. And I think that it's all an antidote to that butterfly syndrome that we feel yeah, that yeah. whenever we want to do something different, mm. which doesn't precisely fit into our historical period, uh, we've, we've got to look at another period. Mm. Absolutely fine. I've done it myself loads and loads of times. Mm. But I just didn't want to do that again. I wanted to have a situation where I could credibly be fighting you know, a French army and an imperial army. But maybe, maybe I've got some of the uh, uh, German horse who've been experienced fighting the Baltic campaign and were using Swedish tactics from the Thirty yeah, Years' yeah. War in Flanders. Well, did that happen? No, it didn't happen yeah. at all. But it could have done. And it's credible that it does. And I think that's one of the things that I'm certainly not saying to people that should do it because it's crackers. <laughs> but it is quite good fun. Yeah, yeah. But it's also, you see, because uh, I'm, I, and again, I've just been writing about this in my book, I'm fascinated with stories, you know, because I'm a writer yeah. as well. Stories fascinate me. And uh, it's, Different people have different tastes in stories. Some people, I mean, I remember my mum could never get her head round fantasy or science fiction, bless her heart. 
but it's all rubbish. It's all it's it's not real. She would say. Yeah. And trying to point out to her that well, an awful lot of what she thinks is real was equally, frankly, bollocks, <laughs> right? You know, there's there's now stranger than the truth more often than not, right? Uh, actually, uh, a lot of stuff that is now real started as science fiction. You know, think about the communicators in Star Trek or Sliding Doors or whatever it was, you know. Um, and uh, this is also something that I... Uh, get really interested in as a kind of crossover point because we're talking about the kind of the blurry edges of what we think of as history what we think of as pure story uh and obviously that word history has you know the second half of it is story okay and then it's just a matter of whose story are we talking about Uh, how are we representing this story one of the things i've been writing about at length in in my book is um why are we so fascinated about this Uh, and you know rich and nick and 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 two fat lardies games with the concept of the big man who's the big man he's the hero of the story right uh, and we're looking we've been talking about two mil micro scale gaming uh, where we're looking at a story presented on one level a, a very high level top down level and at the at the other end we're looking at you know 20 28 mil games like a ch- chain of command or whatever where we're literally looking at you know sergeant dobbs and bill snyman you know rifleman snyman on the front line having trouble reloading his rifle you know that's a, that's a, an, another Definitely. level of hero yeah. and this so this kind of thing fascinates me and the this blurry edge uh, that you've described there uh, which some people say okay well that's crossing over into imagination's territory well yes it is but no it isn't you know there, there's different levels of invention so i actually applaud this notion that you can take what is in our, all other respects a properly researched completely historically correct factual context but then when you see do you know what there's a gap there that i'm not even sure will ever be filled in my lifetime unless i stop doing what i'm doing and go off and write, try and write a phd if i can find the evidence you know because there's not even any guarantee that that evidence exists anymore because over hundreds of years stuff is you know papers perishable wood is perishable all these things that where the evidence may have existed may no longer exist at all they may mm. literally have been absorbed back into the earth so what do you do so I think that this is laudable that you take that, uh, you know, you, you, you start from a standpoint, well, I'm not just going to invent something completely stupid. You know, it's not suddenly <laughs> going to be everyone waving, waving canes and dressed in pink. You know, this is a military unit I'm inventing here but on reasonable grounds. You know, they're on real horses and they're using real weapons and that kind of stuff. And also, who's to argue with that? This is the other great thing about certain periods of history, ancient period, the whole swathes of it. They're still arguing about bloody romphias and stuff, aren't they? You know, did the romphia mm. exist? And if it did, how was it used? You know, was it actually an agricultural implement that people have got mixed up? Who knows? Where there is this paucity of 100%, gar- you know, as close as we can get to 100% guaranteed factual evidence, what is the harm in doing that? I think I think that's exactly right. And I think that it's also a way in which you can have a lot of fun with stretching the information that you have. Yeah. So I'll go back to the Dark Ages in a minute, but just in the 17th century, one of the things that we talked a bit about um, earlier is tactics and the, the multifaceted different tactics. Now, if you take that century properly, you, you have a, a tercio period, and then you have a 30 tertio period. You have a period when tertius are used. You have the 30th war period. Then you have the period where state armies start to grow with absolutism and be able to control the state, better fiscal apparatus. And you end up with these huge armies at the end. And the tactics change. But what if you can actually shake those tactics up? So yeah. your period of for want of a better word, you know, aggressively mounted galloper cavalry, that doesn't just really stop with, you know, or just survive with the Swedes. 
maybe that's something that you do preserve into the 1780s and 1790s with the French or with the imperialists. You make them gallopers. You you can tactically deploy troops on the battlefield in a way that they were never normally used. And you can base them as war games like that. Mm. Your Croatian cavalry, which you talked about before, okay, they're wonderful at the Petit Guerre. They're not particularly brilliant in a battlefield world. Well, maybe that changes. Maybe you mm. can actually make them really credible your battle winning cavalry mm. but you go back to the dark ages and i think people do this all the time you know they think about well what's available as regards a pictish army what's mm. available as regards a british army of cotreath in the late sixth century actually nobody really knows because there's hardly any sources at all it's not that you're making them up you don't even know what to make them up from yeah, yeah. so i think we as war gamers do that a lot anyway and you talked about i know on twitter the other day uh, people were talking about well what were the things which were looked at by those authors of WRG books. And actually in your last battle chat with Richard, mm. talking about extrapolating historical evidence to form the WRG set of rules. Mm. Well, there's a huge amount of historical largesse which is going on there quite legitimately. Mm. All I'm saying is that you can have a lot of fun mm. taking that and going in the direction that you actually want mm. as opposed to the direction that you think the sources are leading you. Mm. Now, of course, you might argue that sometimes historians have got in the direction they want. You know, nod there to Peter Hofschreier yeah, yeah, and the, yeah. the accounts of Waterloo from the Prussian side. Your know, people have done that for years, mm. but consciously doing it to have fun and mm. to create an environment of the game that you actually want as a war gamer, mm. that's fun. That shouldn't be anything that anyone's got a problem with. Mm. Um, of course, then you've got to persuade people that actually you've got a credible game and you haven't just introduced people with ray guns into you know, <laughs> 17th century Flanders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another battle. <laughs> but, because this does, I mean, this obviously ties in with, uh, you know, what war gaming is in any case is speculative. I mean, yeah. the, the, how many times actually do we sit down and play out a completely historical scenario, as in we're reproducing only the, the, the recorded battles, you know, the Waterloo's, the Leipzig's, the whatever it is, right? I, I, even if we do that, even if we do our best to recreate the terrain, to set up the troops in the position that they were known to have been in at the start of that battle, the moment the umpire blows the whistle and off you go guys where well, all hell breaks loose and technically nothing from that point onwards is historical it's made yeah. up it is speculative it is and and so effectively what you're you're describing there with your history and what people do with imaginations because you know even in with my imaginations i want my imaginary nations to be plausible representations of 18th century countries i mm. don't want people with ray guns as you say I, I it's an 18th century environment people behave in an 18th century way if a, a commander in one of the campaigns that i'm umpiring behaves in an un 18th century way they'll get slapped you know mm. i i will roll a dice and load that dice very heavily against them uh but but there's also you know so many other things in there you know when you talk as i said earlier when you read the actual history so much of it, it almost seems like speculative alt history think about artillery the development of artillery where you know uh, gustavus adolphus yeah let's make some guns out of leather you know yeah. iron yeah. hoops wrapped in leather now who would have thought of that who would have thought that who would have thought that? And, oh, let's try breech loaders. And then breech loaders got abandoned and then brought back again much later. Again, a subject I wrote about in War Game Soldiers and Strategy. You know, if, if you were... If you were controlling history, you, you wouldn't have made that up. You would have thought, well, there's going to be this linear progression of that happens, that happens, that happens. Not that happens, that happens. Oh, then they changed their minds and went back to this thing. And then it was only 100 years later they thought of that again. You know, there's, there's so much room for experimentation in what we do as war gamers. And I think that, that that's so true. And part of the tremendous fun is, of course, is that when people think you're making it up, then you can then produce a historical scenario which is actually realistic, but people think is made up. So then you, you, then you bring into play an imperial commander who's so obsessed with uh, the astro astrology and the signs of the zodiac that he'll only do certain things on certain days, yeah. and he'll only confine with his court astrologer. And then you've got a battle in which both sides get completely confused in the fog of um, smoke, and there's a huge number of friendly fire incidents, and both sides retreat. And you get a world in which 
your wargaming looks very much like the account of Simplicimus in the 17th century, that it's all about uh, plunder and pillaging and the complete devastation of the land. Yeah. And you end up with a completely different scenario. And that's actually real. That all happened. Yes, it's Wallenstein. And yes, yeah. it's one of the battles of the Thirty Years' War when it's just complete carnage and chaos and nobody knows what's going and everyone's attacking and retreating at the same time. Yeah. And you try and recreate that in a set of rules and people say, well, I've got, I've got the wrong set of rules here. Yeah, I've got yeah. the wrong game. Uh, yeah. This guy can only move and the aspect of Venus is in Scorpio or whatever like that. Well, actually, sometimes <laughs> the truth is a lot... <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is a lot stranger that you can make it up. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of the fun is that once you start, once you, well, once I started doing it, it's become quite addictive that you start looking at those historical loose ends and you know where you can turn them. So going back to the Twitter post I saw earlier about these two Irish mercenaries dressed as Janissaries, who knows? Maybe yeah, that was really what they looked like. Yeah, and yeah. so you go on all kinds of rabbit down yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I, funnily enough, just I've um, uh, under my pile of books here somewhere is buried um, uh, Phil Barker's book on uh, Alexander the Great. You know, he, the campaigns of Alexander the Great, published back in the eighties. Another brilliant book uh, for war gamers. Uh, and in there, he talks about um, oracles and omens and that kind of stuff, which was so it was commonplace in you know ancient and medieval warfare and as you say people would you know slit open yeah. the guts of a goose or something like that and if the liver was not quite the right color oh we're not fighting today boys there's there's this uh, war game is claiming to play games that are historical when in fact you know what you're dealing with is psychology people and psychology and religion and all that kind of stuff is that it's a heady brew in reality whereas what when two guys get together at a club and they put their troops down they want to be able to command their troops and have them do what they want them to do and they pack them up at the end they and this is one of you know one of the things of course that was has been controversial with some of the lardies rules where you are you know you you have your command dice and stuff and there's quite a few turns where you can't do anything like what you'd really want to do in that turn which i know some people find very frustrating it's not really surprising though is it because you think of us as a community we like to research uniforms and we like to get them right we like yeah. to have certain color of buttons we like our flags correct we buy them from gmb or flags of war yeah. and then we agonize about the basing and how many troops should represent uh, be represented by a figure it's hardly surprising that then people get very upset when you introduce these <laughs> awkward constraints like reality <laughs> that particular <laughs> into that particular hobby i mean how crazy is that damn your friction Clark. <laughs> damn your friction now it's true and you know games that i i whinge about from time to time like commands and colors you know which is uh i'm and uh, funnily enough as i i has i always have many threads going on in my brain simultaneously and one of the threads from an hour, hour or so ago talking that when we we're talking about the two mil gaming was I could do commands and colours with two mil miniatures, and they'd look it'd look like a real battle. Good. But anyway, yeah. um, fantastic! I think we've we've kind of uh, talked quite a lot about alt history there, and it is fascinating where it's at this kind of fringe between the imaginations and completely fictitious and historical. And I think people should think more about that, uh, particularly for periods where there are big gaps in in the record, like the seventeenth century. But one of the other things I know that um, we both share a love of uh which kind of ties in with imaginations and stuff and also with you with what you've been doing with your history and your uh fictitious is it a dutch town of lardas or something lardas? <laughs> that's just me no <laughs> that's lardun <laughs> that's about to lardas lardun uh, uh, Larden, that's it. Uh, on your blog and in your beautiful notebooks, which were, I can't remember where they got revealed, but they got revealed somewhere online. And I, amongst others, perhaps you posted something on Twitter a little bit from one of your lovely notebooks. And I, amongst others, let out a little gasp of admiration because, you know, uh, you're doing something that's so close to my heart. You're keeping journals of your wargaming journey. You know, yeah. uh, and yeah. that's something which I, you know, uh, you know, I applaud. I, I wish I had more time to do myself. Perhaps when I finish writing this damn book, I will. But you, you, yours are really beautiful, and you do little maps and and paintings and all sorts of stuff. Tell us about how this came about, and and what's your what why your love of keeping journals. <laughs> 
that's a really good point. And I think, again, that's something which has grown. So I started when I moved from the First World War, though I did it also for the First World War, but not as regularly. Uh, when I moved to start the 17th century again, so I'd already done it a couple of times before. This is my third time around with the late 17th century. <laughs> um, but when I did it again, I wanted to keep a record of the units I was creating and in particular the paints I was using and the colours I was using. And that's yeah. really all it started out as. Yeah. And then I found that I was carrying them around and I was jotting things down during the day. And I started doing some of the research and putting them in the notebooks. Yeah. And then it eventually grew to that to try and have some form of engagement at that period when I was building the armies yeah. but not yet war gaming with them. So you had a couple of skirmishes, but the armies aren't ready yet. They're not finished. And, you know, one of well, the Flemish and the Spanish army is, but the French isn't. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that I kept the impetus or the mojo going, I wanted to do something with the period. That's partly partly why I was keen about the two mil pibs. I knew I could do that very quickly. Mm -hmm. But also I wanted to be attempting to create the environment for thinking about what sort of rules I was going to use, thinking about the history of the time, mm. thinking about the actual historical things which are happening and what I knew about um, deployment and formation and recruitment. But I also wanted a forum in which I could jot down ideas about how I would stretch history and how I'd try and make that into an interesting, um, plausible narrative which I could supplement what I knew about the history with. Mm. And that grew into writing letters and that grew into drawing maps and that grew into creating characters mm. in a way that it became um, an interest in itself. And I think I thought about it, I hadn't really until you'd mentioned it, really thought about what I was doing. And again, it's not something I would ever recommend anyone to do because it's a slightly nuts thing, but it is a really great augmentation of what is already a fantastic hobby mm. because it's creative and it's some it's a way that i personally want to develop the games that i want to play so when i do have a game and i've done it now with the two mil as well um yeah i can bring out a notebook and we've got scenarios in there we've got characters in there we've got ideas for rules in there and it's all part of keeping motivated keeping things moving keeping it at the front of your mind yeah. and I also really enjoyed taking them on holiday, which is a bizarre thing. You just can't necessarily, especially when you're flying, you can't take your paints, um, not your acrylics anyway. Um, you can't really take the figures because they've got to go in the hold and they're going to get smashed if you come back. And if you're staying in a hotel, there's only a limited number of things you can take. Yeah. But what I did feel and find is that you can take a small moleskin notebook um, around about the size of uh, just you know, a piece of A5 paper. Mm. And you can take a small set of watercolour paints in a tin and a couple of brushes and a very small, you know, one of those old tiny, tiny jam jars you get at hotels sometimes. And they, the little jam things. Li right? Little jam things. You put the water in there. And then you've got a really credible way to create some maps and paint the maps um, or draw some pictures and just paint those up. And you're away from home, you're relaxing, you're on holiday. Mm. And things like that just keep wargaming in the forefront of your mind. And it's mm. another way of just embellishing the world that you're trying to create. Now, mm. it can be a historical world. Um, it can be a fictitious world. It doesn't really matter. But it's a great way of being able to engage with a hobby when you're not actually at the club with your mates. Mm. You're able to engage with a hobby when you're not actually being able to be at the table that you paint at. Mm. Um, and like a lot of these things, the more you do, the more interesting it gets and the more ideas you have. Mm. Yeah, I, it's. I'm so with you there because uh, for me, for long periods, my notebooks were the hobby. You know, mm. where I went long stretches without an opponent or when I was living away, you know, when I did my year abroad in Germany as a student and other times I've been away, the, the notebooks have been the hobby. Now, particularly because I suppose that's also one of the reasons why I developed a love of imaginations, because, you know, I'm a storyteller and it's a great way of combining my my love of wargaming with my love of storytelling it's just you know making shit up basically in <laughs> in the books and coming up with you know generating all the names of commanders and their characteristics and the names of the units and you know uh giving creating a backstory I and mean, one of the interesting things about the 17th century that we've been talking about is i've got this thing in my head that i 
uh, want to go backwards in history. You know, what was Prunkland like and Fountainland like? You know, in the 17th yeah. century. You know, and and uh, give a name check here to uh, Phil Ollie, who's you know been a, a, in around the wargaming scene for many years. He did something similar for his kind of 18th century uh, Sax Bierstein, or no, it wasn't Sax Bierstein, I can't remember uh, the name of his uh, imaginations, but uh, he did something similar because he's always had an interest in the Thirty Years' War, and he, and he created some wonderful stuff, and, you know, he paints beautifully. And that's always made me think that, God, you know, yeah, that's something I, at some point I'm going to do. And of course, the, the starting point, the genesis for that, before I pick up a, uh, you know, a, a miniature or put some paint on any miniature, is going to be the notebooks uh, mm. and creating that backstory. And probably, God knows, I'm, you know, it's going to go further back in history than that. Probably, if I live long enough, I'm just, is what I need to preface <laughs> that with, isn't it? You know, and I'm, I'm just kind of reaching behind me here because on this desk here, there's a couple of my you know old a4 notebooks from going back god knows when uh you know the, the beginning of the story i'm flipping through some some pages here so sid can see them firsthand you know all the they are beautiful the, yeah the units and uh, what i look at them now god they're so neat you know i i had this thing obviously where you know i was it's all done with an ink pen as well with a calligraphic nib it's all terribly terribly neat and all these hundreds and hundreds of unit commanders and their characteristics and and some of the names are quite rude i'm noticing as well <laughs> <laughs> that I'd sort of forgotten about. <laughs> so in case there's any German people listening, I, I, I shan't read them all out. But yeah, it's and I look back at this now and part of me thinks, Jesus Christ, Henry, you were wrong in the head. But also, you know, particularly when I get into the, you know, this is a typical campaign move where I've got the, the, the units listed and the, their map coordinate and, you know, what they're doing and all the rest of it. And then there's, you know, accounts of intelligence gathering and occasionally there's little maps where there's been a little skirmish happened. And then there'll be another thing where I've oh, decided to invent a load of flags for my grimaces yeah. and that yeah. kind of stuff. And... As a thing, you know, when I think, you know, I was writing this back in the, what was it? Uh, well, I started this particular book in 1986, right? And I think, do you know what? I'm really glad I did that. Because yeah. I, I now yeah. it's such a wonderful thing to look back on, you know. That was definitely something which was conscious of. So I remember you posting, and it must have been on Twitter, um, images of your notebooks which were detailing a naval fight between British and French warships of the oh, Napoleonic right, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And I remember thinking that that as well was another great thing to do that you'd actually recall battles. So, you know, some of the notebooks cover the games that we've played, some of them cover the modern games we've played. And the whole idea is to kind of memorialise the experience. Yeah. Because I think that the years do go by, okay, you know, this is the nostalgia bit. But the years go by and the experiences of the hobby are significantly similar mm. as regards as an army you're painting and you're playing games with people. Mm. And that's a fantastic process. Mm. But over the years, you play a lot of games with a lot of people with a lot of different armies. Mm. What were you thinking at any one particular point in time? Mm. And I think that this was also a conscious way of remembering the hobby, remembering the hobby that we have as individuals and we all enjoy it in different ways. Mm. And I think that's something which the bloggers really, really has done in a very mm. public way. And these notebooks are sort of available to be looked at by anyone. There's nothing, mm. nothing prior at all in them at all. Um, but there is something which I think is quite individualistic about that process. Mm. We would each create a different notebook. We would each write down different things. Yeah. Um, and that's really interested me as well. You know, how we, how we record our games, how we remember our war games, um, what we remember as being good about them. Mm. And that was another sort of conscious thing I wanted to try and do is to have a thought process mm. and you know, over, the, over a long period of time in respect of, you know, a number of different projects. Yeah. But to be able to be in that position in 10, 15 years' time and look back at it and say, yeah, you know, I can remember what I was doing there. I can remember painting that unit. I can remember what I was thinking about. Mm. And sometimes there's things I've gone back to, even over the last two or three years or four years since I've been doing this, and thinking, actually, that, that I wouldn't do that again and reminding yeah, yeah. myself what I wouldn't do. Or, yeah. you know, alternatively, that is something which is good. I want to do more of that. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's there's also uh, you know as someone who's you know also a blogger, there's I find that there's a subtle difference between how I feel about what I post on my blog. Quite apart from the fact that you know I'm I'm a thing in you know for my sins I'm a thing in war gaming, and so people view my blog in a particular way. You know they expect us. It's it's a it's a kind of broadcast, whereas the notebooks right. are a, are a more intimate thing. I mean, it's, it's even really something. It's 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 also to do with the fact that I I I handwrite in the notebooks, which yeah. is a different mental process from typing on a keyboard. Yeah. And I've talked to people about this uh, quite a lot in you know with my writer friends that when I'm when I'm writing nonfiction, generally speaking, I'm quite happy typing. I'll sit here at the keyboard. Blah, blah, blah. If I'm writing a poem, I can't do that. It has to, the first process, I mean, I'll eventually type it up, but the first process is always, I literally need to feel that nib on the paper. There's it's a, a really, really excellent There's a kind point. of sensuality yeah. almost about that. Yeah. And and it's different as well when I'm writing fiction. Often I'll write notes first by hand and then transfer that and expand that via the keyboard and these notebooks i find that for the literally you know the imagination part of an imagination and also because there is this other thing that i bring in like you do which is also the illustration side you know the literally getting out a bit of watercolor paint and painting or, or i've got some wonderful colored pencils as well karen dash colored pencils that i love you know and i'll do a little kind of uniform sketch or oh you know da -da. and there's just something uh that is a as i say it's a more intimate process it's a more personalized thing that i feel like i'm very consciously doing it for me first yeah and at, rather than when I'm doing a blog post or a Patreon thing or whatever, oh, this is for my patrons. This is for the people who come to visit my, you know, my, my blog or whatever. I think that's a really excellent point. And that, to be quite honest, I mean, that's why I sometimes find blogging quite difficult mm. because I've always tried to blog things that I think people wanted to read about. And I've always tried to blog things which are completed mm. or if even if I post the work in progress there's, a, there's i know it's been finished because that'll be post three or post four mm. and there is a real element with blogs and you know my blog's been going for 10 years about broadcasting mm. now i haven't really updated it in the last couple of months this have been you know, actually three months this have been really busy and i don't want to post stuff mm. that i don't feel is really worthy for people to sort of sit down and read yeah. about yeah. because it's a show to the hobby and it's also the show to the wider world it's trying to sort of create the best foot forward or the best image that you possibly can of the hobby as much as anyone else it's really there to be helpful to people mm. to encourage people and to give back to people yeah. but i think when you're looking at a notebook there's so many times that i've just picked up the notebook for two or three minutes and jotted stuff down yeah yeah um there's a real danger with the notebooks and i've got into that at one point a few years ago keeping the neat notebook for best and you actually <laughs> couldn't write down anything yeah, yeah. of that unless it was with a calligraphy pen and it wasn't beautifully done yeah. and properly finished and actually those notebooks no surprise folks those were the large a4 dial roni notebooks which were beautiful and they looked yeah. fantastic and i kind of gave up on those and i went back to the really small moleskin notebooks yeah. because they kind of look disposable. They're very small. They can be fitted into a briefcase or a rucksack or anything like that. They can be taken anywhere. They can be brought out at a coffee shop or on the bus yeah, or on the tra yeah. train or the tube. It really doesn't matter. And then they really become a constant companion about the hobby. Yeah. And I think there's an intimacy about their physical proximity because you don't need to get out a big book yeah. necessarily or a perfect book. Yeah. It can just be your communication with yourself through the medium of being writing something down and i think having a pen and actually writing it does make that more immediate and more intimate as you've said and i think because you've got that environment you're likely to use it more mm. uh, okay it's personal it's private i don't care who reads it it's not that mm. kind of personal and yeah, private, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it is certainly something that you can have a real communication with a real dialogue with and yeah. that i think because of that honesty it is really useful because you can look back and say, well, that's what I was doing and that's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 Because I, I mean, I'm reaching forward and I pick up, I've, there's one of my things and this is my war yeah. game writing notes, which yeah. is full of, um, 
just kind of ideas that I picked up from elsewhere, you know, look, because I've been writing the book, obviously. And one of my starting points for, you know, what the hell am I going to write about? I've promised I'm going to write this monstrous <laughs> thing. What the hell am I going to write about? And so just come, stumbling across sources of inspiration, like there, there was a bit of a, a period, uh, uh, probably about a year ago now, I'm, I'm looking at these notes, where I stumbled across a load of board games. I thought, oh my God, yes, why? Why hadn't I thought about that? There's a load of quite useful board games with some interesting ideas that could be translated for people playing, you know, our kind of miniatures, war games, campaigns, and that kind of stuff. And as you said, I mean, if someone came across these at some point in the in the future when I'm dead and gone and and want it, well, they're welcome to it. There's nothing, you know, I haven't written in, in, anything intimate about my sex life in any of these things, you know. But if there is that that level of intimacy where you um it's a psychological process where it's the gestation of an idea it's where you know if i look back i think oh yes that's where that that i gave birth to that idea and i can see now flicking through oh yeah i took that idea from that page and that idea from a couple of months ago and somehow they've just fermented together in my mind and then produced this other thing. You know, probably if I was a Marxist, I'd say it's some kind of dialectic that's going on, you know, idea A plus B equals idea C, you know. And that is the process you go through as a, as a creative person. But I think that's yeah. a, another crucial aspect as a creative person. And, and you know, and one of the things we're going to, you know, I can see we're going to have to wrap up fairly soon because this is turning into a monster show. But one of the other subjects that we love and kind of ties in with this is their love of maps maps yes and, and <laughs> I, as you know i love creating maps and one of the biggest chapters in my book is because if i had a pound for everyone who said to me oh henry how do you do your maps and it's like all oh, right for god's sake all right bloody hell here's a massive chapter about how i actually create maps because a lot of people imagine there's there's some magic piece of software out there that you just plug in and say oh i want a map like this and it gives it to you and so i actually went off exploring and found that actually nowadays there are a couple of things that come quite close to that that will be Mm. revealed in the book but the maps i've created over the years have all started out with and i haven't got a pencil here but yeah they started out with a pencil scribble Every yeah. single map I've created, whether it was a battlefield or an entire imaginary continent, to me, this and this comes back to that intimate process, that actual, the feeling, the physical feeling of a big piece of paper and a pencil and just letting my mind go. And yeah. uh, the thing, I the only other thing I can liken it to Sid for me that process is how I imagine a composer composes a piece of music and they're sitting in front of their you know piano keyboard or they've got the guitar or whatever it is and they're just kind of randomly scratching away and this melody somehow emerges and that's what happens when I just sit down and a map comes out of my head trying to actually explain it to someone how that happens is really difficult. And obviously in, in the book, the compendium and in magazine articles, I've explained, well, there is this process you can go through, which is, well, roll a dice. And yes, that's a coastline and that's a plane and that's a forest and stuff. But in a sense, that's kind of, that's not really what I do. You know, that's how you can do it. But the way I do it is just, I sit down with the piece of paper and a pencil and it, and it arrives yeah, and it's a wonderfully relaxing process. Oh. The process of uh, playing God and creating your own world and environment in which you can design something which you then have use of yeah, yeah, is yeah. A, a really relaxing process. So I do exactly the same. I really, I've always loved maps. I've always been fascinated by maps, historical maps and yeah. actual real life maps now. And I've always loved drawing my maps. And I love to draw maps with um an idea for a scenario in mind. So if you had a scenario which is based around a push of pike or a reconnaissance Mm. or a last gasp over a a battle over a bridge, you know, what would be the, what would be the perfect environment to fight that game in? What would the map you would use? And then what would be that map in winter? And then what would be that map in a different location? You know, not in France, but in Turkey or in Germany or, or, or in Scotland. 
and the ability to actually sit down and just relax and just draw something like that and then paint it mm. uh i've always really loved that and i think that that's that's just a wonderful way of relaxing you know of course yeah, yeah. people relax in different ways and you can of course crank out another 14 french voltigeurs in the time that it goes <laughs> to create a really good campaign map yeah, but yeah. at the same time you've already got 300 voltigeurs why do you not another yeah, yeah, yeah. need another 14 yeah. and uh I know you held up a couple of the books which were available uh, about creating maps and mm. the role playing is a big part of role playing, having uh, fantasy role playing, science fiction role playing online. Yeah. There's a big um, community in the Cartographers Guild that I know yeah. you know well yeah. uh, who work on creating realistic maps and a lot of them are computer generated but there's still a lot of people just doing mm. hand created, hand painted maps yeah. and there's a real renaissance, I think, in hand-created maps. There's a few people on Twitter who are doing a lot and on Patreon yeah. as well. Yeah. And it's a great adjunct to the hobby. It's yeah. like a hobby has so many different facets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Engage and embrace it in different ways. And I think map creation is something which is always going to be immediate to wargamers. And it's not just maps. It's also creating environments in which maps fit within yeah. a different game sequence. So a map is just part of the thing which is displayed to the players. Yeah, so yeah. going back to the 30 Years' War stuff, um, in addition to maps, one of the things that we had in our games of uh, the 30 Years' War and of Lutzen was, was um, graphics, which was the Council of War, that you had to deploy different troops in different locations before the game started on a board. Um, and that was designed with um, PowerPoint, by reference to not just the map which of Europe, not just mm. the map of Bohemia or wherever it is, but also you then got different components on that board in which you physically deploy your forces. So maps for wargamers have so many different mood setting opportunities yeah, as yeah. well as just game playing opportunities. Yeah. For, again, it's just something which is more than just printing off an ordnance survey map. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's such an outlet for creativity. Uh, you know, I it's one of the things that uh, I love. It, it goes back to storytelling because it's setting the scene. And there's something I find, you know, incredibly exciting about that moment when this idea for a landscape pops into my head and then you start populating that landscape with stuff and with civilizations, you know, entire civilizations get born and, uh, in that process and it's just something i love and then when it finally comes to fruition like it had you know with the Aiton games and and other people want to come in and participate in that world that you've yeah. created yeah is an incredible thing how else would you get that i mean that's you know whether you're talking about us as miniature war gamers or as role players or as dungeons and dragons people or whatever you know that, that it's just it's a fantastic part another part of the hobby that you know i just love anyway uh, i'm looking at the clock my dear fellow we've been <laughs> chatting for at least an hour longer than we thought we were going to be chatting and there's probably <laughs> things that. no 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 it's great and there's probably things that we'll i'll go back through these notes that god we didn't talk about that and oh yes i can see that already there's some things that we didn't talk about that was on the list <laughs> You'll have to come back on again. Never mind. Sid. Next time. Next You'll time. I have to come unless, back on Unless again. all your listeners have got their torches and pitchforks ready for me. She's <laughs> <laughs> <is> quite possible. <laughs> oh, dear. Sid, thank you so much. I've, it's a great pleasure. I've thank you. I've enjoyed this conversation so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. The time's absolutely flown by. Uh, and I hope the listeners have too. I'm going to have copious notes to have to put, you know, on the, on the release as, as show notes so people can go and follow links and look up stuff and cartographers guilds and Dutch painters and goodness knows what. Um, all power to your elbow, mate. Uh, keep on with your notebooks and keep on with your nanoscale stuff and everything else you do because I, I think you're one of those people who adds to and graces the hobby don't oh. rush too much uh, i seriously i mean that most That's sincerely very kind. as huey green used to say uh, <laughs> i mean that most sincerely uh but it's true but and obviously in so many regards it a man after my own heart we obviously love so many of the same things um we must go to a dutch art gallery together at some point oh, we never get out <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh dear, Rich and Rich and Nick can come and rescue us. Thanks so much, mate. That's been absolutely Pleasure. brilliant. All right, Sid. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Take care, everyone.